Penawnda, gwrs o bawb i'r cyfarfod llawn, ac yn un i ddechrau dwi angen nodi ychydig o bwyntiau. Cynnel yr cyfarfod hwn ar ffurf hybrid, gyda rhai elodau yn siambr y Senedd, ac eraill yn ymuno drwy gyswllt fideo. Bydd yr holl elodau sy'n cymryd rhan yn rhyfodion y Senedd, le bynnag y bont yn cael eu trin yn gyfartal. Mae cyfarfod llawn ac yn helu'r drwy gynadledd fideo, yn unol â rheolau sefydlog Senedd Cymru, ac yn gyfystyr y thrafodion y Senedd, a thibennion deddf Llywodraeth Cymru 2006. I'm not going to be able to do this agenda. Before we start uh, the meeting and before any of you try and get in on being the first to congratulate the Welsh football team, uh, let, let me be the person to do that on all our behalf and to uh, say to the football team how, how, and the Football Association of Wales how proud we all are as a Senate of their tremendous uh, success. And I can tell members that I'm already looking into whether there's a conflict of timing between games and plenary uh, sessions in order to see how we can sort that out uh, later on uh, in the year. Felly, ewn i mlaen i'r eitem gyntaf y prynawn yma, sef y cwestiwn e i'r prifwyn i dog. Ac mae'r cwestiwn cyntaf gan Darren Miller. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's position on Senedd reform? Uh, shall we? The Welsh Government will seek to implement the conclusions of the Senedd on this matter. Thank you for that response. Of course, the conclusions of the Senedd uh, Committee tie in very well with the conclusions of the discussions between you and the Leader of uh, Plaid Cymru. And of course, if those, uh, if those conclusions and recommendations are implemented, it will be the most significant shake-up to uh, elections to the Senedd since it was founded back in 1999, scrapping the current system whereby 40 members are elected on a first-past-the-post basis. Now, when such significant changes to voting systems have been presented uh, in the past, they have been put to the public vote for the public to have a say via a referendum. Back in 2011, when there was a proposal to scrap the first-past-the-post system for Westminster elections, quite rightly, the UK Prime Minister David Cameron put that decision into the hands of the public via a referendum. Given that there was no specific mention of an increase in members of the Senate in your party's manifesto for the last Senate election, do you accept that there is a need for the public to have a direct say on the package of proposals which is being put forward before this Senate and will be debated tomorrow? Uh, shall we, the public have already had their say. Yes. They elected members to this Senate in a sufficient number to bring about, as Darren Miller said, uh, the greatest reform uh, of the Senate since its uh, inception. Those of us who stood on manifestos in favour of reform look forward to taking this to a conclusion. Alan Davis. President Officer, uh, I don't know what you were doing, First Minister, in 1973. I was in Dickstown Junior School in Tredegar. I'm not sure what Darren Miller was doing in 1973, but I'm sure he was. I'm sure. I'm sure he wasn't reading the report of Lord Kilbrandon, who reported at that time that Wales needed a Parliament of 100 members. Since then, we've had reports from Ivor Richards, from Laura McAllister, from everybody who's looked at these matters, and they've all come to the same conclusion. And yet, for most of, in fact, all of Darren Miller's lifetime, the time has never been right. The reality is they stuff the House of Lords, as they have already yeah, yeah, today, yeah, yeah. today, with unelected leaders. They put them straight in the UK government without any democratic uh, accountability, and they come here seeking uh, a referendum, not because they believe it, and I don't believe any of them believe the nonsense they talk on these matters, but because they simply don't like Welsh democracy. Do you agree with me, First Minister? Well, so with, uh, every nine months, the Prime Minister appoints more people to the House of Lords than we propose adding to the membership of the Senate. Every nine months. Where's the referendum on that? I wonder. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I agree entirely with what my colleague Alan Davis has said, you cannot find uh, an independent report into the representation the people in Wales need in order to take the important decisions that are made here on their behalf, who believe that 60 members is a sufficient quantum to discharge those responsibilities. And that goes back to Kilbrandon, it goes back further than Kilbrandon. 
even to the 1950s and reports on what was then called the Council for Wales. Uh, we have this opportunity. It doesn't come often. It's taken 20 years since the Richard Review in order to find a moment where reform is possible. We must grasp it now, and those parties in this place who have an investment in making sure that Welsh democracy is able to deliver for people in Wales will, I think, gather around these proposals and want to see them succeed. Question by Jane Bryant. What's the Welsh Government doing to encourage new green spaces in South East Wales? Uh, I would thank the member for that question. Our Local Places for Nature programme has created over 300 green spaces across Wales in the last year alone. 22 of them have been developed in Newport, including the work which I know the member will uh, be familiar with, undertaken at the Pill Community Allotments. Mm -hmm. Just over two years ago, I raised in this chamber the terrible state of the infamous road to nowhere in my constituency, a piece of land that's been blighted by fly tipping on an industrial scale, with 100 tonnes of rubbish stretching as far as the eye could see. I'm so glad to say that we've moved on since then, following some great work by Newport City Council and the local volunteers. The land is now clear of the rubbish and is in fact being reclaimed by the community. Through the dedication and commitment of those local volunteers, particularly formidable campaigners Sue Colwell, Caroline Antonew and Helena Antonew, they are now transforming the road to nowhere into a road to nature. They are striving tirelessly to improve access ways and footpaths and are, work, are working alongside the Council of Conservation Groups such as Bug Life Cymru and the Bumblebee Conservation Trust to turn this area into a nature reserve that everyone can enjoy. This transformation embodies so much of what Welsh Government is striving to do in terms of biodiversity, the climate emergency and green spaces, but it has in no way been an easy process for those involved. So how does the Welsh Government plan to ease the process in which local communities can reclaim land for green use? And will the First Minister join me on a visit to the road to nature so he can see for himself the fantastic work being done and to meet those dedicated volunteers? Uh, well, sorry, I thank uh, Jane Bryant for that. I remember her contribution uh, of that time ago because, as I recall it, it was in the context of the new powers that were being provided to local authorities uh, to tackle fly tipping proposals brought forward by my colleague Leslie Griffiths. And I know that uh, in turning uh, the road to nowhere into a road to nature, those powers have been used uh, by Newport uh, Council and by those local community activists who have done so much to transform what was a, particularly, uh, a particular blight uh, on the landscape of that part of Newport. Uh, I've seen pictures recently, myself, put up by the group of the transformation, showing what it was like before they started work, showing the fantastic green spaces that are being provided now, highlighting the work that the Council is doing to provide greater access uh, to the road so people can now uh, enjoy it. I'd be very uh, pleased indeed uh, to join Jane Bryant on a visit to the site. And in thinking of her question about how can we make it easier for people uh, to take part in these sort of activities in the future, it seems to me that a very good place to start would be by learning from the people who've been involved in this scheme, hearing from them about any barriers that they may have faced and ideas they will have for how that could be improved in the future. And I look forward to meeting them uh, when that visit can be arranged. Peter Fox. Uh, dear, dear Clareth, and, uh, I thank Jane Bryant for raising this issue. Uh, Clareth, whilst it's important that we create new green spaces for people to enjoy, it's also important that we protect and enhance existing green spaces too. Now, back in March of this year, revised plans were submitted for a large solar farm on the Gwent levels. This came after the original plans were rejected by the Welsh Government due to its potential impact on the area, which is, of course, a site of special scientific interest. Clareth, we all know that we need more uh, sources of reliable renewable energy, but this mustn't come at any cost, and such development should, as much as possible, work with nature and the environment rather than potentially being detrimental to it. First Minister, what action is the Welsh Government taking to ensure that new developments and infrastructure projects do, don't unnecessarily uh, reduce the amount and accessibility of green space available to communities, and what consideration have Ministers given to strengthening planning rules to ensure developments are net contributors to the natural environment? Environment. Hmm. 
Well, uh, I thank Peter Fox for that additional question. Uh, so if I know that he's got uh, expertise of his own. He was the leader of Monmouthshire County Council when the council created a solar farm, uh, and uh, a scheme that the Welsh Government was very pleased to support. So uh, I'm, I know that he will have seen for himself the balance that has to be struck between renewable energy developments, which are absolutely necessary, and their impact uh, on the local environment. Uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, it is very good, Llywydd, to hear a voice on the Conservative benches here looking to preserve uh, the environment of the Gwent levels. Uh, it's not always been the policy of our party, as uh, we know. Uh, but as you have seen, and uh, Peter Fox pointed to that example, uh, that where there was a proposed development uh, that the Minister felt did not weigh up properly the benefits and the disbenefits of it, she was prepared to take action and to prevent those developments from taking place. So I give the member uh, an assurance that the Welsh Government continues always to weigh up uh, those many factors, both the positive reasons why renewable energy developments uh, could be given the go-ahead, but also the impact that they have on the local environment and the need to strike that balance in each case. Christina Nargan, Arwain Weir of Plaid, Arwain Neith of Cade Wadwyr, Andrew Artido. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And could I join you in congratulating the Welsh football team yeah. and the great prominence that will give Wales as a country on the international football stage and wish the team well when the championships arrive. Uh, and obviously, hopefully, with your planning, you can make sure there are no clashes with the uh, Premier League business, especially at the end of November in particular. Uh, First Minister, two weekends... Two, two weekends ago, two weekends ago, we saw traffic chaos and travel chaos here in South Wales, with the Ed Sheeran event and My Chemical Romance, which is a group, I'm told, rather than a night out in Cardiff <laughs> on my, my part. <laughs> Whilst we welcome all this activity here in South Wales, because Cardiff has truly become a destination city, the traffic and travel chaos that we saw over that weekend really cannot be allowed to continue when major events happen in this part of Wales, because it does happen at sporting events, and now we've seen it graphically amplified over the three days of the Ed Sheeran concert. What analysis has the Welsh Government taken about what actions need to be taken to address these traffic bottlenecks so that we do not see this occur again? Uh, well, thank the member for that question. And it's undoubtedly the case that the confluence of two major events in Cardiff and the start of the half-term holiday resulted in very high volumes of traffic, all trying to arrive in Cardiff on a uh, limited period of time. Whenever there is a major event in the city, there is a team of people who meet afterwards to review the experience and to see what more could be done to either mitigate the impact of those high volumes uh, of traffic or to provide additional services. Uh, Transport for Wales are currently in the process of loaning two trains from Northern Trains in addition to the new CAF, uh, the new CAF uh, trains that are planned to enter service this summer uh, in order to allow them to provide that additional capacity when we have uh, busy events and a confluence uh, of different factors that leads to the sort of delays that we saw over that weekend. First Minister, I'm glad you introduced Transport for Wales because one of the main criticisms was the ability to get onto trains and the supplying of information for people queuing at Cardiff Central Station. Now, that is a pretty basic function of any transport operation and doesn't cost a huge sum of money. So the flow of information is critical for passengers understanding why they're stuck in those bottlenecks. Do you accept that on this occasion, Transport for Wales did fall short because we knew it was obviously the start of the spring bank holiday. We knew that two major events were taking place, and yet greater emphasis should have been provided on capacity, but also the supply of information for people attending the city who had a very bad experience, to say the least. And these experiences were amplified on the broadcast media right over the bank holiday weekend. Yeah. Uh, well, so I, I make a distinction between the two points that the Leader of the Opposition has made. Uh, I think on capacity, it is genuinely difficult to expect a train company with fixed assets uh, and a fixed pool of 
uh, staff able to uh, provide those services to turn the tap on in a major way around any sort of event. And that's particularly true of train services. You simply can't magic trains out of the air for a couple of days. Uh, you've got to be able to afford them all year round. Uh, and you have to have staff that are competent and capable of providing a safe service. So I think that is a genuine challenge, and I don't think Transport for Wales can be criticised for the efforts they made to mobilise the resources at their disposal. Where I do agree uh, with the Leader of the Opposition is in relation to information. Uh, anybody who has been stuck in any form of traffic event, whether that's at an airport or at a train station, knows that the one thing you need is good information about what is happening. Uh, and even when that information is difficult and is going to tell you that you're going to be delayed or stuck or whatever, you would rather know what you are facing rather than feel that there's nobody able to tell you uh, what it is that is going on around you. So uh, that is an important point for Transport for Wales to take away from that event. Uh, while I don't expect them to be able to find capacity out of thin air, I do expect that when there are events of the sort that we saw, that every effort is made to make sure that people who are attempting to travel are kept as well informed as they can be. I accept the point on capacity, First Minister, but it was a case that the trains that were planned to run, in many instances, didn't turn up at Cardiff Central Station. So I accept you can't magic trains out of thin air, but the trains that were supposed to run didn't even turn up on the nights of the Ed Sheeran concert, which exacerbated the problem when the other concert was held in the capital city. But we also saw over three nights the gateway into South East Wales and South West Wales, the Bring Glass Tunnels, do their usual trick of putting clothes to business because the traffic was piled up beyond the Severn Bridge. Now, we have a policy difference here, First Minister. I believe that there should be a relief road built. You do not. I accept that you're the government and that's your decision and that's an argument that has passed us by now. But what cannot be allowed to continue, as we all want to see Cardiff's capital city being a city that can stand shoulder to shoulder with the major cities and destinations of Europe, that traffic cannot be brought to a standstill when major events were on. Do you believe that there needs to be a revision of your transport strategy so that we can cater for these peak demand moments that obviously affect the freight industry, affect people going on holiday and people going about their everyday lives? Because we cannot have the close for business sign over the gateway for South Wales. Uh, shall it, the uh, um, Leader of the Opposition will, I know, uh, understand that even if a decision had been made to go ahead ahead with an M4 relief road, it would have made absolutely no difference at all over the last weekend, because it would, even from today, be another five years uh, before such a road could be open. So it's not a solution to the problem that he has identified. Where the real solution comes is through the UK Government's Union Connectivity Review. Uh, so what I am looking forward to is the next stage of that review. The UK Government has provided money for the next stage, the development stage of the review. He will note that Sir Peter Henry said that this was one of the schemes that fitted more than almost any other scheme that he had seen within the criteria set down by the UK Government for investment in transport infrastructure that would assist travel through the different component countries of the United Kingdom. Uh, and if we can get the Union Connectivity Review to put that investment into the second line, the line that is there alongside the current main line, that will allow for far more services to be run on the railways between South Wales and on past Bristol uh, into the rest of England. Had that been available over last weekend, then I think it would have made a genuinely material difference. And I look forward to the UK Government's finding the money to go alongside the report that it itself has commissioned. Price. <laughs> Uh, ar lefel eich hangach i, 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 uh, I Gymru gyfan. Uh, beth eich chi'n meddwl prifunidog uh, fydd gwaddol cyrraedd uh, cwpan y byd 
dim ond am y reil droed i oed yn wneud o ran hyder ni uh, fel, fel cenedl. Uh, ac o'n i dwi'n profi uh, gyda'r math o ymroddiad ar undod, undod y tîm, y staff, y cefnogwyr, uh, gyda'i gilydd, um, bod ni'n gallu cyflaw ni unrhyw beth fel, fel cenedl. I, ni, I ni'n ffocusu'n meddwl ni an, an trad, ac yn falle yn achos o'n hennes i, I ddwylo hefyd ar ni. Um, o'n i dyw Cymru nid yn unig yma o hyd, o'n o ran y genedlaeth yma yn barod ac yn, ac yn hyderus y gallwn nhw llwyddo ar unrhyw lwyfan yn genedlaethol neu'n rhyngwladol. Uh, well, diolch o fawr i yr yn poes am y cwestiwn uh, llawydd ffraint o dde uh, i fod yn, uh, yn y, y stadiwm uh, ar nos dydd sydd ac y teimlad, oedd y teimlad yn y stadiwm oedd o'n mor grif tu ôl y tîm Cymru, ond nid just i'r tîm Cymru, y parch o bobl yn dangos at bobl oedd yna i cefnogi uh, i'w crain hefyd, oedd hwnna yn rhywbeth oedd yn taro fi. Uh, yn, yn eistedd uh, yn, yn y stadiwm. Uh, ble oedd yn un eistedd o gwmpas i bethau pobl yn siarad amdano, llawer iddo nid ydy'r peldroed, oedd gwrs o'r peldroed yn bwysig dros ben, ond beth oedd y tîm, a llwyddiant y tîm, yn ddweud am Cymru heddi, a'r hyder o dan nhw. A ni'n gwybod, you know, dros y blynyddoedd, uh, fel genedl, a uh, ni wedi am beth waith wedi cael diffyg o hyder. A na'n dyfodol ni, yn yr capacity ni i wneud penderfyniadau ar pethau sy'n pwysig i bobl yn Cymru. Yn i wedi weld tro ar ôl tro, a temau dod just ar y ffyn i fod ar y llwyfan ar lefel y byd, ac yn mwmwyd ola oedd hwnna'n cwmpo yn ôl. Dyna ar y pwysigrwydd oedd bobl yn siarad amdano yn y stadiwm, a peldroed oedd cwrs, ond yn neges oedd y tîm a popeth oedd yn digwydd na yn rhoi i bobl unwedig, bobl ifanc, bobl sy'n tyfu lan yn Cymru heddi o bobl yn cyfeirio at uh, a bobl ifanc yn y tîm. Bobl sy'n wedi dod trwyddo yn awr ac yn chwarae uh, i Gymru. A hwnna yw y llwyfan sy'n pwysig i ni. Llwyfan y cwpan y byd oedd cwrs, ond llwyfan eu hanga na hynny i adaladu hynny hyder am bobl am yng Nghymru am y dyfodol a beth allwn ni wneud pan i yn I, I, I think the, the, the fact that even on this momentous occasion, the first thing the Welsh players did uh, was to comfort the Ukrainian players and to applaud the Ukrainian supporters, I think was an encapsulation of the best of our Welsh values of compassion and internationalism. Uh, the Chief Executive, uh, Noel Mooney, uh, if we could only bottle that Celtic energy, you'd be more popular than Guinness. Um, he, he, he said that... Uh, they're not just the Football Association, they're a movement. And, and in so many ways, they embody the values of the Wales we want to see. Modern, bilingual, creative, inclusive. So how can we use the World Cup uh, with its unparalleled global audience to project that image of that uh, uh, Wales? Um, uh, the, the FAW have a lot on their plate, don't they? Not least a, a few games they want to win this week. So. Uh, um, Will the Welsh Government be setting up a team with people from across different sectors to exploit this fantastic opportunity uh, for Wales? Uh, the FAW had their first meeting uh, to uh, plan for Qatar at 9pm on Sunday <laughs> evening yeah. and another one at breakfast the, the, uh, uh, the next morning. Can we show the same sense of urgency and commitment as them at the national level to maximise this opportunity? Uh, well, sorry, I'd, I'd like to just use the uh, opening Adam Price has offered to pay tribute again to the, to the team from Ukraine uh, and the, their supporters in the ground. When you think of uh, the background to that uh, game, uh, they were fantastically committed. The team never gave up right to the very end of the game, and you could see just how much it mattered to them as well. I thought they were an absolute credit uh, to their country. Uh, and we should pay some tribute to the FAW, too, under the leadership of Noel Mooney. Uh, it is an organisation transformed. Uh, the things that Adam Price just said about the FAW, you would not always have been able to say those things uh, of it during its history, could you? Uh, but under uh, its new chief executive, 
uh, the Football Association of Wales does see itself as playing a different part in the public life of Wales than simply running football teams. Uh, and the, the things that you will have heard uh, him say, and you and I had an opportunity to discuss some of those things with him on Sunday night, I think absolutely does demonstrate an organisation that has captured the zeitgeist, but understand that this is a moment for them in which they can help embody a series of important values about the sort of Wales we would all wish to see. And of course, we will, as a government, uh, be working uh, alongside them and with them to make sure that we maximise the opportunity that Wales' exposure on that national stage, a first game against the USA. You know, I seem to remember President Trump saying that if uh, Joe Biden were to win the uh, presidential election, uh, the USA would end up looking like Wales. Uh, I thought it played a significant part in Joe Biden's triumph in that election myself. Uh, but now we'll have an opportunity to show people across the USA just what Wales has to offer. Football has given Wales this incredible opportunity. Uh, there, there's huge potential here to inspire, uh, connect people, change lives, transform communities, build the nation. But we have to invest, don't we, to make the, the most of that. Uh, there will be a massive rise of interest in, in football among boys and girls, and we need to support the women's team uh, to reach the FIFA World Cup in Australia and uh, New Zealand next year also. We need to make the most of this sporting uh, dividend, which is, is, of course, a health and well-being div dividend, both physical and mental. In my own hometown of Ammonford, it's the football club that is the heart of mental well-being outreach following the tragic loss of, of one of its uh, team members. So how are we going to invest uh, as a nation in the physical infrastructure, in the social infrastructure of clubs, so we can make sure that this World Cup le leaves a legacy, not just in Qatar, uh, we hope, uh, uh, in workers and human rights there, but also in every community in Wales and for generations to come. Well, uh, shall we, Adam Price uh, touched on there. Uh, an issue which we should not duck, should we? You know, we are absolutely delighted that Wales will be represented at Qatar, but we should not look the other way from the reservations that we would have as a nation, from some of those human rights uh, issues uh, that we see there. And when my colleague uh, Vaughan Gethin was in Qatar uh, in May, he took the opportunity, as he set out in his written statement to the Senate, to raise those human rights issues directly with Qatari authorities in the context of the World Cup. Uh, and we must ourselves make sure that those opportunities are not missed while the eyes of the world are on that country. Uh, here, one of the things that, uh, as I sat next to the chief executive during the game, uh, there was a man who had a £3 million cheque riding on the result of the game. He knew that if Wales proceeded to the next stage, then part of the way the World Cup is organised, the £3 million would arrive uh, with the FAW. And he said to me that he was determined that £2 million of that £3 million would be invested in grassroots football and grassroots facilities here in Wales. And you know, he was absolutely explicit in saying to me that while, of course, you know, the, the shop window of football in Wales is what we were all watching. What really matters to him and to the FAW is the health of the game at that gra grassroots level. It's why the Welsh Government, through Sports Wales, has invested £24 million uh, in recent times in facilities for grassroots sport uh, in Wales. And I completely, you know, very much agree with Adam Price. What you hope to get out of the sort of coverage and exposure that there will be of the World Cup is an inspiration to young people to be out there playing football themselves, taking part in whatever sport they find suits their aptitudes and abilities. Uh, and the Welsh Government will be there trying to make sure that we play our part in maximising those opportunities. Question three, Laura Ann Jones. Thank you. What discussions has the Welsh Government had with UK sports councils regarding the inclusion of transgender people in sport? Well, so it's Sport Wales was established by Royal Charter on the 4th of February 1972. Since 1999, it, rather than UK bodies, has been responsible for inclusion policy in sport in Wales. The Council, nevertheless, works with other sports organisations 
and together published joint advice on transgender inclusion in domestic sport in September of last year. Dear uh, uh, First Minister, um, I feel the need to be clear, and I think it's important that I make it clear, that protecting women's rights does not for one moment mean that you're anti-trans rights. Female competitors deserve the same rights as male competitors. We all know the huge benefits that sports can offer, and we all, I'm sure, want to ensure trans athletes can participate in sport. But what we don't want is a situation where we're trying to be so inclusive that it is at a detriment of a particular group. We have a situation where women athletes are so disheartened that they are pulling out of their own female categories because they say that trans women taking part in female category have a male puberty advantage. Welsh Conservatives are looking at ways that we can help ensure that every athlete can compete, looking at ways that we can work with sporting body bodies across the board and look at creating an open category to ensure fairness, inclusivity and safety across the board. I'm sure that we'll all agree above all that it is of paramount importance that we ensure fairness in sport. It is fundamental to sport. First Minister, do you believe that trans athletes should compete in female sports? As however you feel on this issue, to resolve it, it is fundamental that one can define a woman. So, First Minister, can you do something that no other, well, many, not many other Labour politicians have failed to do so far, which is define a woman? Uh, well, so with my starting point uh, is the same as Penny Mordaunt, the UK minister responsible at the time, who said that the UK government's starting point was that transgender women are women. Uh, and that's my starting point in this debate. And look, it is a difficult area where people feel very strongly on different sides of an argument and an argument that you know, divides people who agree on most other things. What I say to the member uh, is this, that in such uh, a potentially divisive issue, the responsibility of elected representatives is not to stand on the certainties of their own convictions, but instead to work hard <laughs> to look for opportunities for dialogue, uh, to find ways of promoting understanding rather than conflict, and to demonstrate respect rather than to look for exclusion. I do not understand the point that the member makes that you can be too inclusive. Uh, to me, inclusivity is absolutely what we should be aiming for here. And the way to resolve those challenging issues that she's identified, and I've got no objection at all to her identifying them, but the way to resolve them is not to assume that because we ourselves may have strong views that that allows us to um, cast doubt on the sincerity uh, of views held strongly by others. It's only by dialogue and by understanding that you can reach an, a conclusion to the sorts of questions the member has raised. Question per Edward Jane Dodds. Um, I wonder if you could outline the Government's approach in relation to supporting local authorities with a growing number of children subject to a child protection plan. Uh, well, so we're providing additional funding to local authorities safely to divert cases from the Child Protection Register using procedures which were developed in partnership with safeguarding boards. The Welsh Government works closely with those regional partnership boards and with local authorities themselves to strengthen and improve safeguarding practices across Wales. Um, I want to state firstly uh, my thanks to all of those working in social services and social care who have worked and continue to work tirelessly to protect the most vulnerable in our society, especially throughout the pandemic. But I do want to raise again the need, in my view, for an independent inquiry following the terrible, yeah. tragic death of Logan Mwangi looking at our children's social services across Wales. This is happening in England following the terrible deaths of six-year-old Arthur Labinia Hughes and one-year-old Star Hobson. The author of the Independent Inquiry in England has said that failure to tackle major problems in children's services would lead to record numbers of youngsters entering care. As you will know, there are more children in care in Wales than in England or Scotland and children in Wales are more likely to enter care than their counterparts in England or Scotland. Could I ask you, First Minister, 
uh, to consider that children and families in Wales and the workforce deserve the detailed consideration that has been afforded in Scotland and in England through an independent inquiry. Well, I thank the member for that important question. She makes a series of uh, points that absolutely deserve to uh, be thought through carefully. Uh, I've said many, many times on the floor of the Senate, Llywydd, uh, that the rate at which children are taken away from their families uh, in Wales is unsustainable, that the gap between the rate at which children in Wales are taken into public care continues to accelerate away from the rate in other parts of the United Kingdom, and the result is, and this is the reason why uh, it is unsustainable, is that local authorities find all the money they have for children's services taken up in looking after children who they have now direct responsibility for and nothing left to help families through difficult times where a bit of investment in preventative work could have helped those families to stay uh, together. On the specific issue of another inquiry, uh, I certainly don't think this is the moment to commission such an inquiry. In the case uh, that the member highlighted from Bridgend, the serious case review uh, is still to report. There are other cases in Wales before the courts still where court hearings are yet uh, to be concluded. So I don't think this is the moment uh, to make a decision about an inquiry of the sort that Jane Dodds has advocated. And I think there would be other important questions that we would need to think through as well. Uh, are we short of advice, Flaweth? Well, in 2018, we had the care crisis uh, review here in Wales. In 2019, we had the Nuffield Foundation's Born into Care in Wales report. In 2020, we had the Public Law Working Group's report into the way the public law proceedings can be improved in Wales. Last year, we had the legacy report uh, of the Improving Outcomes for Children Ministerial Advisory Group, chaired by David uh, Melding. Uh, and this year, we have continued to receive the thematic reports of the Wales Centre for Public Policy into looked after children. This is not an area that anybody could argue that we are short of independent advice that has looked across the whole practice uh, landscape here uh, in Wales. And are we confident, Lawid, about what we might learn from the huge effort that would have to go into an inquiry of the sort that would do justice to the points that Jane Dodds has raised? We know we have to tackle issues of recruitment and retention in this workforce. We know that we have to invest in prevention and de-escalation in the system. We know that regional working is an important component in the answer to the challenges that children's services face today. So I, I think it is incumbent on people who uh, argue for a public inquiry to articulate where they think the gaps in our knowledge uh, are to be found and where they think we would learn something that we don't already know about the challenge facing those services and the answers that have already been devised to meet those challenges. Gareth Davis. Thank you very much, Llywydd. Uh, uh, First Minister, we saw a massive rise in the number of uh, children on a protection register uh, b b even before the pandemic, so Lord only knows what the situation is truly like now. Um, because, we, because we know that the social services are under tremendous strain, short-staffed and overworked, we simply don't know what's being missed or who's being missed. We do, we do know that children's social care in Wales is in a crisis. Um, those are not my words, but the words of Professor Donald Forrester, uh, Director of Cascade and an expert in the field. He and many other of, um, colleagues, alongside um, us in the Chamber, are calling for an urgent review of social, um, so, uh, children's social services. So, First Minister, will you um, now listen to the advice um, and, uh, and, and heed the calls for, an all, um, for a full independent review of children's um, social uh, care in Wales, just like every other nation are doing. England, Scotland and Northern Ireland are all doing it because we can't keep burying our heads in the sand and do nothing until another child dies of abuse or neglect. Thank you. Well, uh, had the member been listening to my previous answer, he would have heard the answer to 
uh, his question. If we are to have an inquiry, then it would be helpful, wouldn't it, to establish some basic accuracy in the facts that people put forward. It is simply not the case, Slawit, as the member suggested, that the number of children on child protection uh, registers was growing in Wales in the period prior to the pandemic. In fact, the opposite is actually the truth. It would help a little, wouldn't it, if people took the trouble to establish a few basic facts before they offered us their opinions, because the numbers were reducing, not growing. That is the fact of the matter. Numbers have recovered post-pandemic to where they were before the pandemic began. So when Jane Dodds referred to the growing number of children who are subject to a child protection plan, she was referring to a recovery in those numbers. The number is not above today, where it was prior to the pandemic. So if we're going to have an inquiry, then I think a bit more light and a little bit less heat would probably assist in making it a worthwhile exercise. Question Pimp, John Griffiths. Government working with media outlets to promote Welsh-based journalism. Uh, thank John Griffiths for that question. So, with amongst the actions taken to promote Welsh-based journalism is a commitment to provide financial support to public interest journalism. That support will continue over three financial years, as confirmed in the cooperation agreement. First Minister, last week was the 130th anniversary of the South Wales Argus, um, a paper that's long been rooted in our local communities. Um, as with many local people, the South Wales Argus was always in my house um, when I was growing up. And in fact, in my early teens, I delivered the South Wales Argus um, on my bike as a paper boy. And now, of course, as a member of the Senate, it's still a vital organisation for me to engage with. First Minister, it's obviously very, very important for Wales, for life in Wales, for our communities here, and indeed for our development, developing democracy, that we are, have a thriving national, regional and local medium in Wales, helping to inform people what's going on, including inform them of Welsh Government policies and action, and engage them with our democracy. I think the pandemic highlighted the value of our media in Wales when it was so important for people to understand the particular policies and measures of Welsh Government in combating the pandemic in, in our country. Um, First Minister, given this importance, and we, I think, all want to see a thriving uh, media in Wales, will you pledge to continue working with that media in our country, including local newspapers, so that they can continue to play this vital role long into the future? John Griffiths for that. Uh, Shall we? I was very pleased to be able to send a message of congratulations to the South Wales uh, Argus a week or so uh, ago on its 130th birthday. And uh, John Griffiths is right, shall we, that the appetite for news about Wales and decisions being made in Wales was undoubtedly lifted by the experience of the pandemic. The Welsh Government has carried out over 250 press conferences during that period, 200 of them carried live uh, by the BBC, and over 50 organisations have taken part to ask questions of ministers during that period. And uh, John Griffiths is right, you know, that the span of interest in Wales went from questions from CNN for a global audience at the one end of the spectrum to questions from the Caffili Observer uh, and from FE Live uh, at the other end of the spectrum. And uh, investment in grassroots public interest journalism is very important to create a pipeline of journalists for the future. Um, it's always a slightly tricky uh, thing, isn't it, for government to invest in, in journalism. I'm always uh, reminded of what uh, the famous American uh, journalist H.L. Mencken said, that the relationship between a journalist and a politician is the same as the relationship between a dog and a lamppost. Uh, <laughs> And there's a good reason for that, uh, isn't there? You know, that we want journalists to be uh, separate from the political world. There is a way, and we are finding the right way, to make the sort of investments that John uh, Griffiths mentioned, to be able to put investment into those grassroots without in any way 
compromising the capacity of journalists and news agencies here in Wales to carry out the job of scrutiny and, where necessary, criticism uh, that they quite rightly fulfil. Uh, I want to very much echo the comments of the member for Newport East. Welsh-based journalism and Welsh language journalism can play a critical role in delivering our fantastic language to a really important audience, especially in our rural communities. Having started my professional career as a journalist working for local newspapers, and I'm not sure if I'm now the dog or the lamppost, but I've seen firsthand the importance of BBC's local democracy reporting service, a public service news agency funded by the BBC and providing by the local news sector. Its reporting delves into our communities and ensures that local stories are given the attention they deserve. However, the LDR service does not explicitly fund any full-time Welsh medium journalism positions, although stories that are written by democracy reporters are shared with media outlets that have signed up to be part of the local news partnership scheme. Records show that there are 21 organisations which currently publish in excess of 70 individual titles for Wales-based audiences. Of those 70, only one is a Welsh media service. Given this, how are you, First Minister, encouraging Welsh language news outlets to sign up to the BBC's local news partnership scheme? Diolch Llywydd. Uh, well, uh, can I thank Sam Kurtz for that, because uh, he makes very important points about uh, the significance of Welsh language journalism. Uh, and the Welsh Government does, again, you know, invest directly in this area in a way that is justified by the language component of it. So the Welsh Books Council has a ring fence budget uh, that funds Golug, uh, 360, Corgi Cymru and other news outlets. I think that the changing nature of Welsh medium education in Wales actually I think will support a revival of Welsh medium reporting here in Wales as well. Uh, as young people emerge from Welsh education with a capacity to read the language and to receive uh, information through the language that maybe wasn't true even 20 years ago, uh, and therefore that there will be a commercial as well as a cultural uh, imperative to do that. And certainly it is part of our motivation in wanting to invest in these areas to make sure that we have a future of young digitally skilled, inquisitive young journalists with an accurate grasp of devolution and able to operate fully in a genuinely bilingual environment. Question Davis. What support does the Welsh Government provide to deliver integrated public and community transport in the Ogmore constituency which meets the needs of transport poor constituents? Uh, well, can I thank uh, Hugh Aranka Davis? Uh, so since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have worked closely with the bus industry to keep services running, providing £130 million of additional funding to prevent communities from becoming isolated. And that funding has indeed helped, but even before the pandemic, we'd had a decade of austerity which had impacted on local authorities and had impacted on cuts in services, including subsidised bus services. We're looking forward to the reforms that will give control back to people, I have to say, local communities and regions to take control of coordinated bus services and wider public transport within their areas. But my question is about the here and now. We look to excellent initiatives like the Flexibus schemes. Community transport are involved in some of those. But what we fail to see is that joined upness right at this moment. So I have a direct question and ask of the First Minister, and I notice his colleague here, the Minister, is sitting right next to me. It's whether he and his Minister would be willing to sit down with me and officials from Bridgend as well and to look at how we can pull the very best of what's currently available so we can join this up. So we don't have hilltops like my stake Park, remote valley communities such as Ponteril and others who are isolated because of the cuts we've seen over the last decade and more, where we can really make sure that everybody who wants to get to see their friends, wants to get to the shops, to the surgery and so on, can do so. What can we do right now? Could you help us with that? Mm. Uh, well, uh, I thank uh, Hugh Anthony Davis for that. He's right that the long term uh, and so by long term I mean during this Senate term, uh, is the radical reform of bus services that we will bring forward through the bus bill you know, to reverse 
those 30 and more years of marketisation in the bus industry, which has left communities of the sort that Hugh Alanka Davis has referred to without a service, because there isn't a commercial uh, case for doing so. And yet, millions of pounds uh, of public money is put into the bus service uh, every year here in Wales. I hope I'm not anticipating an announcement that my colleague was about to make. Uh, but on top of the £130 million which we have provided to sustain bus services during the pandemic, uh, I know that my colleague has uh, agreed a further £43 million to go on sustaining those bus services over the rest of this calendar year. Uh, and that does give an opportunity to do uh, what the member for Ogmore has suggested. Uh, I know the Bridgend uh, County Borough Council has been one of those councils where reductions in funding from the UK Government has constrained their ability to sustain those community services. But now with the new Labour controlled authority in Bridgend, it will be a very good moment to meet uh, and to discuss with a local authority how that investment that we will uh, provide can go on making a difference to the places uh, that the member has highlighted this afternoon. Question Saith Alevachan. The Ochlewid. Prigwinitok, Sid Mashamodred Cymru and Guithogita Borg Yachid, Privas Kol Kumta Morganog, Iwesha, Gwasanitha Yachid Medal. Well, the Ochi Helev Vachan, shall we draw him in Parhai, the Pari Kachid? So, with all Arthur Heiss, Igebnogi Gwasanitha Yachid Medal, Led Led Cymru, and Augusta A. Kachid Krayv, Ad Gaver Yachid Medal, with Borg Yachid Privas Kol Kumta Morganog. And Kyle three point three million or Gathid Rayolai, that's when they go, Argaver Gosanai Eleni, Ermoin Bisodi, Mount Gwes, Darpariath, Yehid Medal. Lots of chatting going on behind the First Minister. If we can have a bit of silence for the First Minister, yeah. especially from his own members. Hello, Vachant. Mae'n gwneud yn gwybod o'r un siŵr bod ar olygaeth gofal iechyd Cymru yn cynnal adolygiad ar y fynyd sy'n canolbwyntio ar ac yn asesu ansawdd a diogelwch trefniadau rhyddhau ar gyfer cleifion sy'n oedolion ar ôl i'r gymuned o unedau iechyd meddwl cleifion mewnol o fewn bwrdd iechyd Prifysgol Cwmtaf Morganog. Dau hyn yn sgil nifer achosion tri sy'n wedi cael sylw yn y wasg, megis achos lwri mille naeth farw ddiwrnod yn dilyn cael ei rhyddhau o fel iechyd meddwl yn ysbyty Brenhinol Morganog. A hefyd, wrth gwrs, achos Zara Ann Radcliffe, laddodd John Rees mewn siop yn Hennegraig ym mai 2020 trantioddau o sgitsofrinia. Yr un dwrnod y ceisiodd ei thad erfyn ar y bwrdd iechyd a gwasanaethau cymdeithasol i roddi cymorth iddi a mynd â hi i'r ysbyty. Mae nifer o achosion cyffelib o ran pobl yn marw ar ôl cael eu rhyddhau wedi dod mewn i'n swyddfa fel gwaith achos. Ar hyn sydd yn pryderu ydy yn dilyn yr adolygiad fi yn um, 2019 gan arolygaeth gofal iechyd Cymru a archwilio Cymru bod 14 ar gymhelliad neithwyd adeg hynny yn parhau ar agor. Gwn hefyd am bobl sydd angen triniaethau bris yn cael gwybod nad oes capacity o gwbl i wneud hyn, gyda arbenigwyr yn anog pobl i fynd yn breifat oherwydd a dyma ddyfyniad gellu bore yma gan glaf a ddywedwyd gan ddoctor wrthi the NHS isn't fit for purpose and people are dying waiting for treatment. Doctor and Daedorth Claf i fynd yn breifat ac yn dweud y geiriau hyn. Oes unrhyw ystyriaeth yn cael ei roi i'r angen i roi bwrdd iechyd cwmtaf Morganwg mewn mesurau arbennig ac os nad oes ystyriaeth a newch chi ymrwymo i edrych ar hyn ymhellach fel llywodraeth. Well, my system da ni'n barod llywydd pan ni'n edrych i fewn i beth sy'n mynd ymlaen mewn unrhyw bwrdd a ledled Cymru, mae tri o gorff yn dod dygilydd i roi gyngor i'r gwynidog. Mae nhw'n gallu roi uh, gyngor ar y bwrdd i gyd, neu mae nhw'n gallu ddweud bydd rhaid i ni roi fwy o gymorth uh, i'r unrhyw bod, a uh, ti'n gweithio mewn unrhyw faes yn y maes uh, iechyd. Dwi Dwi ddim wedi weld dim byd uh, gyda'r a, a, a bobl ti'n dod dygilydd i ymgynghori ni. A I wneud beth oedd yr heredd fachan yn awgrymu. A fel wedais i llywydd yn yr ateb radio, a ni fel llywodraeth yn rhoi fwy o arian ar ben popeth arall mae'r bwrdd yn gael ac ar arian maen nhw'n gael i redeg a system iechyd meddwl 3.3 miliwn o bunoedd 
Yn y flwyddyn hon, ac yn y flwyddyn nesaf, ac yn y flwyddyn ar ôl hynny hefyd, i bydd soddi mewn gwerth darpariaeth i echyd meddwl, a trwy wneud hynny, a ni oedd cwrs yn edrych, a at y bwrdd i wneud fwy, a, ac i roi, a, i ddatblygu gwasanaethau yn y gymuned, a, sy'n helpu i bobl gyda problemau a, i echyd meddwl, a, ac i jyst helpu nhw i wneud popeth, mae'n angen iddyn nhw wneud yn fodau nhw bob dydd, a heb, heb, sorry, a, without the need, heb yr angen a, i cael a, fwy o'r gwasanaethau ti fewn i'r ysbytau. Ac yn ôl â chwestiwn wyth, Sian Gwenllian. Diolch, Llywydd. A wnaeth uh, prifunidog reid diweddariad am ddyfodol canolfan awyr agored plas mennau yn arfon. Uh, well, Diolch, Llywydd, Sian Gwenllian, Llywydd. Cyfrifodiad chwarae yn Cymru i wreoli plas mennau a ganolfan awyr agored genedlaethol. Yn y dyfodol, dylid adaladu ar enw dar canolfan gan ddarparu gweithgareddau antur awyr y gored ffyddiannus drwy gydol y flwyddyn. Dydy sy'n cyrhau mwy o swyddi lleol a mwy o effaith ar yr economi lleol drwy'r proses honno. Dwi wedi codi pryderon am y newidiadau sy'n ar y gweill ar gyfer plas menau efo dyr prwy wynidog diwylliant a chwareion. Fe all y broses sy'n mynd rhagddu ar hyn o bryd arwain at breifateiddio'r ganolfan, ac mae pryder y bydda hynny yn cael effaith negyddol ar amodau gwaith y gweithwyr, y cyflisterau sydd ar gael i bobl leol ag ar yr iaith Gymraeg. Nowch i ymuno efo fi yn gyrru neges glir i chwareion Cymru yn dweud y dylid oedi'r holl broses sy'n mynd rhagddu ar y funud, er mwyn cytuno ar ffordd ymlaen fyddan gwella'r ganolfan ond fydda hefyd yn diogelu cyfraniad holl bwysig plas menau i'r gymuned a'r economi leol. Wel, llywydd, gyrhau chi mi fod yn glir, nid yw Lywodraeth Cymru yn cefnogi prefeteiddio aset pwysig hwn. Lydym am weld y dyfodol yn datblygu yn y ffordd dwi wedi disgrifio, gan symud y tu hwnt i'r defnydd tymhorol sydd yn ganolbwyntio yn bennaf ar a'r gweithgarwch dŵr. Wrth gwneud hynny, rydw i a'r gwynidog yn disgwyl i ddatblygiad gael ei drafod yn ofalus gyda'r gweithlu lleol a fechnogaeth y ganolfan i'w chadw ar gyfer y cychoedd yng Nghymru. Diolch i'r prifynidog. Yr eitem nesaf, felly, yw'r datganiad y cychoedd busnes a dwi'n galw ar y trefnydd i'w wneud y datganiad hynny, Leslie Griffiths. A dear Llaid, I've one change to today's agenda. Instead of a statement on COVID-19, the Minister for Health and Social Services will make a statement to update members on Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board. Draft business for the next three weeks is set out on the business statement and announcement, which can be found amongst the meeting papers available to members electronically. Natasha Ashka. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, may I ask for a statement from the Welsh Government about the Future Valleys Consortium and its contract regarding works to complete uh, improvements to the A465 Heads of the Valley Road? In November 2020, your Government confirmed that the Future Valleys Consortium had been awarded the contract to take forward improvements to Section 5 and 6 of the A465 Head of the Valleys Road following their appointment as preferred bidder five months earlier. It is now reported that one of the directors of the Future Valleys Consortium was formerly finance director of Dornus Construction, a firm which collapsed in 2019 with debts of nearly £50 million, as well as the hundreds of private contractors from Wales and throughout the UK who were affected by the collapse. Some public sector bodies are now, have now lost out, including Powys County Council, which lost £1.3 million, and your own government, which lost half a million pounds. Legitimate concerns have been raised regarding this appointment, which has resulted in someone involved in one of the biggest corporate failures in Wales, now monitoring the expenditure of millions of pounds of public money on a major infrastructure project. Therefore, can we have a statement from the Minister about the appointment process that brought about the situation in the interest of transparency and accountability right here in Wales? Thank you, Minister. Well, I, I don't think uh, this has anything to do with a, a lack of transparency. I'm aware that uh, information was gleaned uh, by the Freedom of Information Act, and I don't think that should be viewed as uh, non-transparent um, at all. Uh, obviously, um, you know, Welshmen have, have worked very uh, closely 
uh, and have invested equity via the Development Bank for Wales into the A465, and that the investment is a key pillar, really, of our efforts to ensure uh, schemes promote uh, the public interest, particularly MIM schemes. Arlen Davis. Thank you, President Officer. We are, uh, Minister, this month uh, marking the 40th anniversary of the war in the Falklands. Mm -hmm. And it's important, I think, that as a parliament, we recognise the contribution of uh, Welsh uh, servicemen and women in that campaign. Uh, I met recently with the government of the Falkland Islands, along with um, our Conservative colleague, Darren Miller, and we spoke there about the contribution and the links mm. between the Falkland Islands and Wales. Um, the British Legion in Ebu Vale will be laying a reef uh, to remember those who were lost um, recovering the Falklands, and I'm sure in communities up and down Wales and elsewhere, other reefs will be laid to ensure that we do not forget mm. the sacrifice and the loss of people who helped recover the Falklands. Would it be possible, Minister, for the Government to ensure that we have time here in this place to remember the Falklands campaign and to mark the 40th anniversary of it? Uh, I think many of us will want to join um, ministers and others at the service in Llandaff Cathedral, mm -hmm. but at the same time, as a parliament, it is important that we mark this anniversary and we remember the sacrifice of people who were lost. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Alan Davis uh, raises a, a very important point, and the Welsh Government has been working with partners right across uh, the armed forces sector to mark the 40th anniversary uh, of the Falklands conflict and, of course, recognise the sacrifices that were made by many uh, Welsh service personnel. I know, I think it was last Sunday, uh, the Deputy Minister for Social Partnership took part in a Falklands 40 anniversary bike ride that started at the Falklands uh, Memorial at Alexandra Gardens in uh, Cardiff. And a group of veterans are making their way by bike uh, over eight days to uh, Aldershot uh, in tribute to all those who served uh, in the conflict. Alan Davis mentioned the service that will be held at Llandaff Cathedral, and the First Minister uh, will, be, uh, will, will lead uh, the Wales Falkland 40 service uh, there. And I know, again, the Deputy Minister is attending the Royal British Legion Falklands 40 service at the National uh, Memoriam Ar Arboretum. Um, in my own constituency in Wrexham, we are having a, a, a Welsh Guards Memorial Service and reunion uh, to, mark the, uh, to mark Falklands 40. And I know that wreaths will also be laid in the Falklands Islands uh, on behalf of the First Minister during upcoming services of remembrance. Mark Isherwood. <coughs> uh, yeah, Clive. Uh, could I call for a, a single statement on um, rail services in North East Wales? Um, I don't know whether you read in our local press last uh, Saturday um, reporting of the Wrexham Vinston Rail Users Association um, saying that Transport for Wales appears incapable of providing passengers with a reliable service, um, that they're operating a reduced service last Saturday on the Borderlands line running from Wrexham, Shotton and Bidston onto the Wirral. The usual, usual hourly service reduced with direct trains running at two hour intervals and Transport for Wales' own journey planner website making no mention of that day's reduced service and regular commuters going to catch their usual uh, trains um, finding that they're not operating. In fact, the uh, Users Association contacted me afterwards and said the reduced service is also now being shown on the line on Sunday. And there's an intimation on social media that 150s um, from the Wrexham, Bidston and Conway Valley lines have been redeployed to South Wales because of the football match in Cardiff. Quote, the Wrexham, Bidston line service continues to be perceived in the communities it serves as unreliable, and most of the long-promised service improvements have yet to be realised. This is not the sort of service your constituents should expect from Transport for Wales. Uh, any assistance you could give to seek immediate and sustained improvement with passenger information and service reliability through the Senedd would be greatly appreciated. So I call for a statement from the Minister for Climate Change or her deputy uh, to explain what happened and to uh, answer to the uh, concerns raised by the Rail Users Association um, regarding the service last weekend again uh, when faced with such circumstances. Um, thank you. Well, you will have heard the uh, First Minister say in an answer to uh, Andrew R.T. Davis that uh, there have been some disruption in relation to Transport for Wales. And, and I agree with what the First Minister said around a lack of information. You know, it, it doesn't cost much to make sure that information is out. And I think uh, you know, Transport for Wales will be able to learn 
from uh, the lack of information that they gave uh, to passengers over the weekend. I should just say, Transport for Wales, you know, they're the first operator, they're the only operator actually in the whole of the UK to restore uh, their full pre-COVID level of services and I think you know, they deserve uh, recognition uh, for doing that but unfortunately we have seen some disruption not just in North East Wales but uh, ac across all parts of Wales over the past few days. Jane Dodds. Dear Clywith and good afternoon, Trevnez, and to continue the transport theme, um, could I please request a statement from the Deputy Minister for Climate Change on discussions in relation to the renewal of the North-South Air Link? Uh, I understand that the value of the contract with Eastern Airways totaled almost £3 million between 2018 and 2021. Uh, subsidy uh, ended up being about £142 per passenger in 2019. And I'm aware that the contract for the North-South Air Link is due for renewal in 2023. Um, and obviously, this, the public subsidy comes on top of our commitment to climate change and the need for reduction in air travel, particularly short-haul flights. Thank you, Dirk Maria. Thank you. There will be a Welsh Government statement before the summer recess. Paul Davis. Uh, um, can I uh, ask for two statements from the Welsh Government this afternoon? Firstly, I'd be grateful if the Minister for Health and Social Services could bring forward a statement on ophthalmology. The Minister for Health and Social Services could bring forward a statement on ophthalmology services that I've received from people waiting urgently for treatment. Some of those patients have wet macular degeneration, and while there is no cure, it can be treated, of course, with eye injections mm. to try to protect their remaining sight. However, these injections must be given, of course, in a timely man manner, and sadly that's not the case at the moment. So I would be grateful if you could encourage the Minister for Health and Social Services to bring forward a statement on the matter as soon as possible, telling us what measures the Welsh Government are now taking to address this issue. Secondly, can I also request a statement from the Deputy Minister for Climate Change on speed reduction schemes across Wales? The Welsh Government initially committed to reducing the speed limit on the A40 in Sclera in my constituency at some point in this financial year. However, I have now received a worrying response to a written question confirming that current capital budget allocations for trunk road network operations in 2022-2023 require all projects to be re-evaluated. Now, I did raise this with the Finance Minister who did not who didn't comment specifically on this matter. And so, in light of that lack of clarity uh, on this. Could you implore the Deputy Minister for Climate Change to bring forward a statement on speed reduction schemes across Wales so members can understand exactly when many of these schemes will now take place? Uh, thank you. In response uh, to your first question uh, around uh, ophthalmology services, and particularly uh, you mentioned wet macular degeneration, obviously it's a matter for the Health Board to ensure uh, that treatments are given in a timely manner. I absolutely recognise the importance uh, of that. I will certainly ask the uh, Deputy Minister for Climate Change if he has any uh, further information he is able to give you uh, on top of uh, the answer to your written question uh, to write to you. Russell George. Uh, George Clareth. Uh, Minister, I wanted to raise the issue of the length of time it takes for replies from ministers uh, in terms of receiving correspondence back from members of the Senate when they write to them. Uh, some ministers reply in a very timely manner, uh, other ministers do not. And I give the example of the Minister for Climate uh, Change. Uh, I sent a, uh, a correspondence via email in January and I'm yet to receive a reply, despite sending chase emails in February, March, April and again last week. Can I ask, Minister, when do you believe is a reasonable time frame into which correspondence should be received back from ministers to uh, correspondence from members. And can I also ask, Minister, uh, if you would discuss this matter with your colleagues to ensure that ministers do indeed send timely responses to members of this chamber? I think you raise a very important point, and, and clearly not having a response uh, from January is, is unacceptable. It, it's the biggest portfolio, obviously. Uh, in government, however, I, you know, I, I do ac absolutely uh, accept your point, particularly if you have uh, chased it up. Uh, I personally, so I, I do think, I think it's 17 days, working days at the moment, and I think you know, that is 
uh, about the correct time. Uh, however, I also appreciate it depends how detailed and how complex uh, some of the responses have to be, and they can take a little longer. But I go back to what I was saying before. Just a, a holding note uh, is helpful, I think. So I will certainly raise this uh, both uh, with my ministerial colleagues, but also with the Permanent Secretary. Diolch i'r uh, trefnydd. Ar eitem nesaf felly yw eitem tri a hwnnw yw'r datganiad yn y dirbrwy wynidol partneriaeth gymdeithasol ar y bil partneriaeth gymdeithasol a chafael cyhoeddus galwyr y dirbrwy wynidog i wneud y datganiad. Hanna Blaidyn. Diolch, Llywydd. Ar ran Llywodraeth Cymru, mae'n bles y geni gyflwyno bil partneriaeth gymdeithasol a chafael cyhoeddus Cymru y Senedd heddiw. Y wneud hynny, hoffwn i ddiolch i'r holl boneriad cymdeithasol, clyflogwyr y sector cyhoeddus a sector preifat a undeb a'i chlafa yn Cymru, a mae holl gyffraniadau, gyffraniadau at y gwaith o datblygu defwriaeth bwysig hon. The Bill fulfils a key programme for government commitment to place social partnership on a statutory footing in Wales. It provides for a framework to enhance the wellbeing of the people of Wales, including by improving public services and through social partnership working, promoting fair work and carrying out socially responsible public procurement. The Bill establishes a Social Partnership Council for Wales, bringing together government, employers and worker representatives nominated by the Wales TUC. The function of the Council will be to provide information and advice to the Welsh Ministers in relation to the social partnership duties, the pursuit of the prosperous Wales, a prosperous Wales wellbeing goal by public bodies and the socially responsible public procurement duties. The legislation also provides for a public procurement subgroup of the Social Partnership Council to be established. The Bill places a new social partnership duty on certain public bodies and on Welsh Ministers. Certain public bodies will be required to seek consensus or compromise with their recognised trade unions or where there is no recognised trade union or the representatives of their staff when setting their wellbeing objectives and delivering on those objectives under Section 3.2 of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act 2015. This duty goes beyond a simple requirement to consult, though, we, though through it we expect public bodies to be actively engaged with their recognised trade unions or other staff representatives as genuine partners in the setting and pursuit of their wellbeing objectives. Welsh ministers will be placed under a separate duty to consult social partners, employers and worker representatives through the Social Partnership Council when delivering on their wellbeing objectives under Section 3.2b of the 2015 Act. The Bill amends Section 4 of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act by replacing decent work with fair work within the existing A Prosperous Wales Goal. Back in 2018, the Welsh Government established the Fair Work Commission to make recommendations to promote and encourage fair work. The Commission's report, Fair Work Wales, published in 2019, recommended that the actions by public bodies under the 2015 Act should incorporate for fair work. The Bill also creates a duty for socially responsible public procurement Almost £7 billion of public money is spent each year through procurement in Wales. Under the new duty, specified public bodies will be required to consider socially responsible public procurement when carrying out procurement to set objectives in relation to wellbeing goals and to publish a procurement strategy. Public bodies will also be required to carry out contract management duties to ensure that socially responsible outcomes are pursued through supply chains. Finally, the Bill imposes reporting duties on the relevant public bodies and Welsh Ministers in relation to the social partnership duty and socially responsible procurement duty. As I said in my statement to the Senedd on the 14th of September last year, this Bill has been the subject of extensive consultation. Crucially, it has also been prepared in collaboration with our social partners. Through the help, wise counsel and occasional challenge, I am confident the Bill presented to the Senate today is an ambitious yet practical step forward for social partnership in Wales, which will, continue to, which will contribute significantly to the achievement of our wellbeing goals. Social partnership is not new and is certainly not unique to Wales. However, social partnership has evolved, become a Welsh way of working, and over the course of the last two years, this way of working has demonstrated very clear benefits for workers, employers and government alike, as together we sought to manage the impact of the COVID pandemic and to keep the people of Wales safe. <coughs> Welsh Government has a long-standing commitment to this way of working, and we want to future-proof social partnership to ensure future generations can benefit not only from better wellbeing, but also from strong, sustainable public services underpinned by a social partnership approach. The framework established by the Bill will help social partners work better together in pursuit of the wellbeing goals contained with the Wellbeing of Future, of Future Generations Act. The Bill aims to make Wales a better, fairer, more prosperous place to live and work. 
and the mechanisms in the bill are intended to help unite government, workers and public services in Wales towards a common vision that of a prosperous, resilient, healthier, more equal Wales with a cohesive communities, vibrant culture, thriving Welsh language and a globally responsible Wales. The bill builds on an already extensive history and success of social partnership working in Wales. And I am committed to continuing to work in social partnership as this legislation progresses and I look forward to further discussions with Plaid Cymru as part of the cooperation agreement and how we can maximise the impact of, the new, of this new legislation. In closing, De Clothe, I very much look forward to the contributions of some plenary members both today and taking forward the Social Partnership and Public Procurement Wales Bill. George Jones. Thank you, Deep Royce Clowers, and, and thank you, Deputy Minister, for your statement and for the introduction of this bill. However, despite your efforts, I do believe that there are overwhelming points of issue with it. Firstly, the Social Partnership Council that has been proposed is likely to just consolidate existing social partnership mechanisms on a statutory basis, thus endorsing the status quo and removing the impetus to improve fair work through supply chains. Secondly, there is existing legal duty on public bodies to protect people from discrimination in the workplace and in the wider society, as laid out in the Equality Act 2010. And so what this bill will simply do is increase a regulatory burden on public bodies. This will be problematic because public, public bodies in Wales are in all likelihood going to struggle with implementing additional regulation. We have heard in this chamber that 5% of public bodies still claim to have never heard of this government's flagship policy of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, and many more have struggled to fulfil its requirements. So I ask the Deputy Minister why this government believes that this bill will improve public body procurement when public bodies, with the help of this government and a commissioner, cannot fully implement regulation that has been in place for nearly 10 years. Thirdly, I believe that there is insufficient quantifiable evidence that this bill will bring any significant benefits to fair working supply chains because it is grounded entirely on the faith that there will be a positive impact. As you know, Deputy Minister, previous efforts to increase the social impact of procurement, such as the European Social Fund project, revealed no tangible evidence of positive results to either local economies or fair work practices. Uh, Deep Port of Cloud, the best case scenario that this bill can hope for is that public procurement contracts ensure fair work practices in those areas where goods and services are at present being procured which is rather limited exercise since public bodies already have the means to do this and for the most part they already do it. Furthermore, this bill will not be able to address unfair working practices in areas outside of public supply chains, which is where most of the support is needed. So I wonder, Deep Royce Clive, what is the real purpose of introducing such a bill? I believe that this government's purpose for the bill is to increase the power of trade unions by giving them an equal say over public procurement contracts, which is a dangerous scenario to be in, because it will mean that trade unions will now be able to withhold or slow down public procurement at their discretion and effectively hold public bodies to ransom by stopping consultation on procurement contracts until their demands are met. This will be challenging for public bodies during disputes as trade unions will now have even more leverage to stop public bodies from functioning. On another point, we must be mindful that trade unions are not infallible to corruption. As we know, Unite, the Labour Party's biggest supporter, have employees being investigated for bribery, fraud, money, laundry, lo money laundering, and current investigations have recently seen Unite properties, including the headquarters, raided by several police forces. Deep Roy Cloud, it is not hyperbole to say that this government's bill could see corrupt trade union officials receiving funds from prospective suppliers to manipulate favourable places ahead of the queue for public procurement contracts, as well as being able to bully and coerce suppliers into meeting their own specific demands, putting suppliers' backs up against the wall with threats of losing contracts if they do not comply. It could even create the scenario that trade unions may receive generous campaign contributions from prospective companies looking to secure lucrative public procurement contracts. Thirdly, because trade unions are now going to have to scrutinise public procurement chains, it will mean more than just facility time payments will be needed. Trade unions will need personnel who are properly trained and their time will need to be appropriately paid for. Because, Deputy Minister, you cannot expect trade unions to scrutinise fair work and fair pay practices without themselves receiving fair pay in return. So undoubtedly, trade unions have to receive at some point public money to carry out these regulatory duties. 
And for those members of Plaid Cymru looking to support this bill, you need to be very much aware that this bill will ultimately be piling public money into trade union coffers, who will then be donating more money to the Labour Party, which is certainly a conflict of interest. Surely, Deputy Minister, it is glaringly obvious that an independent body which can hire the best people without political affiliation that do not pay contributions to the Labour Party would be a much better place to scrutinise contracts to ensure fair pay and fair work conditions. They can, the <coughs> they can then report back to government and public bodies and the appropriate decisions can then be made. I argue that given all the points they have made, there is very little grounding for trade unions to take on this role within the public procurement contracts. In conclusion, I would like to say that ensuring fair work throughout supply chains is an immensely positive step. However, the current system already allows for that. Legisl legislation from this government already places a duty on public bodies to review proper working conditions and fair pay through their supply chains. So ultimately, this bill comes about from a mistrust of this government towards public bodies and the ability to effectively review their own supply chains and a desire by the Labour Party to give trade unions a suffocating grip on public procurement in Wales. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions that may have been in that? Um, because can I please remember this is a statement and not a debate at this point in time. I have a request for a point of order from Jack Sargent. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to raise this point of order. And I've asked the Welsh Conservative spokesperson to reflect on the language he has used during his contribution this afternoon with regards to trade unions and uh, Welsh trade unions. We're based on no evidence, very disrespectful and distasteful comments around corruption in Welsh trade unions, and as a proud member of a Welsh trade union, two of them in fact, and I'm speaking of the residents of Wales, not just members of the Senate, I'd ask the member to withdraw those comments. I am not clear whether that's a point of order, but you've made your, you've made your statement quite clear at this point. Hannah Blay then. I will try my best to address some of the more substantive contributions from the member there, given this is a significant and landmark piece of legislation and it should be treated with respect as such. However, I would say, I, you know, once again, the member does at best misunderstand the intent of the legislation, not least the content, but seeks to deliberately misrepresent it as well for his own political ends. And I extend the invitation, as we do to all members, for a further technical briefing as part of this legislation. I would be more than happy to sit down with the member myself to go through the legislation in detail to address some of the points that he has made today to see, give him reassurance and actually to make clear that actually what we are doing is about giving equal voice and equal weight, actually making sure that we strengthen fair work in Wales. And the point that the member made towards the end, I mean, I've taken that as that fair work is great as long as, you know, workers who are impacted by that aren't given an opportunity to shape that or have a voice. Um, so what this legislation seeks to do is to, to underpin that work, social partnership work that we already have, to put it on a more formal footing, because actually to give us that greater um, connectivity and consistency of approach so we can be as effective as we possibly can and to strengthen that with the legislative underpinning but also for the social partnership duty on public bodies and many good employers not just public bodies already work in social partnership and what this does is actually just strengthen that and give them the support and opportunity to do that as well and in terms of procurement successive reviews of procurement in Wales have actually in recent years have shown that we need to legislate in order to make good practice and make progress and delivering well-being outcomes through procurement and make it more consistent and this legislation is responding to those reviews that says how we need to build on that and improve in the future. And just one final point to pick on that the member says to address is around the, the points he makes around supply chains. Actually, this, the, the, the contract management duties in this legislation seeks to strengthen that around uh, supply chains, particularly within, in the first instance, in the construction sector, where we know there are significant challenges in terms of um, the way in which the, the sector works and the uh, and um, the amount of kind of the, the, the length and the complexity of the supply chains, but also in terms of actually how um, how we ensure we strengthen the statutory code of practice when it comes to the outsourcing of any public services. And thank you very much uh, for the update today, uh, Minister. There are elements within the draft that we welcome, and we look forward for the opportunity to influence its impact as referenced by the Minister's statement. 
Since 2012, Plaid Cymru has continually called for increased public procurement. Uh, we want to increase Welsh firms' share of contracts from 52% to 75% of the public procurement budget. It is estimated that this would create 46,000 additional jobs and safeguard many existing jobs in the Welsh economy. That is a potential benefit that would be transformational for our local economy, our local businesses and our local communities. So my first question is how may the bill be used to drive up public procurement from Welsh companies and businesses as part of supporting the Welsh economy, for example, through exploring the use of targets? I note from the consultation responses earlier, released earlier this year that several issues of concern were raised by key partners. The Bevan Foundation raised a number of important points during their consultation response, including the need to address a wider labour market context in which the Social Partnership Bill will operate. On fair work, they stated that the proposed processes seem very cumbersome and that there was a risk that processes consume too many resources, resources that could be better directed to achieving change on the ground. Consultation responses, such as the TUC, also raised concerns of the clarity of the definition and principle of social partnership, and suggested the definition could be strengthened to acknowledge that while it is important that social partners recognise and respect each other's interests, it is also important that each other's mandates and respective areas of expertise are recognised and respected. How have these points been addressed since the publication of the consultation responses and, in particular, how have they been incorporated into the Bill? An emphasis on fair work, or as you have newly defined it, decent work, has become even more salient amid a climate of poor working conditions in recent years. In 2019 and 2020, we saw Cardiff University staff take strike action over pay and working conditions. In September 2021, after hero heroism throughout the pandemic, workers in the NHS pushed unions to get behind their demand for a 15% pay rise. And last November, bus drivers in Blackwood, Brimawr and Cumbran underwent strike action against low pay and cut to basic terms and conditions. Could you please set out how the bill would have helped workers in those situations and what it means for groups considering taking strike action? And finally, Deputy Minister, this Government has suggested on multiple occasions that they intend on tackling the climate emergency in a holistic manner. The TUC made a suggestion that a commitment on, gre on green recovery could be made through this Bill by addressing the skills pipeline issues. This could be done by working with unions and others to identify how workers in impacted sectors could adapt their existing skills whilst also creating new jobs for those who have lost their job in the pandemic. Could, this could transform the retrofitting industry, for example. Is this bill meeting this potential, and seeing as it seeks to align closely with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, how is it meeting the environmental wellbeing of Wales? Um, can I thank the, the member for his contribution and the, the commitment from Plaid Cymru to actually do what work with this, with this bill proposes to harness the, the power of, of public procurement and the broader benefits it can bring because the measures outlined in the bill seek to leave, leverage the power of the public purse to pursue and deliver, more importantly, outcomes that are beneficial more broadly to, to our communities and to our economy and to our environment. And, the way we carry out our procurement and commission and the rig in which we actually manage that, um, those commercial arrangements in particular on the supply chains, has a direct input on fair work, but also other wellbeing um, outcomes in Wales and further afield. And um, you know, led to this legislation provides the opportunity to, to, to go further in delivering those wellbeing goals for procurement. Um, and that's why we've chosen to include those broader wellbeing goals as part of the legislation, as well as simply fair work and those procurement duties about contributing to environmental, social, economic and cultural wellbeing. Um, but apart from the contract management duties, the bill contains um, no further detail about expectations in its categories. And I think that's why there is a really opportunity here to, issue, to work together and 
developing statutory guidance that sets out how public bodies should set out those socially responsible procurement objectives and what should be included in that procurement such as in annual reports and importantly get that data um, to include the data that we need to be collecting reporting in order to actually better meet those objectives that the member and colleagues on the Plaid Cymru benches have you said you've been raising since 2012 it's almost as you know I've, we've always been developing this bill for almost as long as that it feels some of the time but there really is you know um, I never thought that I would be stood somewhere and say um, procurement is very exciting but actually you know it does you know you smile knowingly there there, there are um, um, this is a framework piece of legislation, but it does bring with it huge opportunities in terms of actually to demonstrate what we can do here in Wales in terms of where we place that social value when it comes to procurement and what we can do, for, not just for fair work, but like we say, those broader benefits, and um, whether that's within the environmental benefits or actually in terms of our communities and, and actually making sure that we are investing in Welsh economy and, and, and our communities right across the country. Um, some of the more broader points around social partnership uh, in generally. Um, so we've tried to find real alongside the legislation what we actually mean by social partnership and that is working together um, in, uh, it, with a common agenda for to provide mutual gains for the benefit of all parties but alongside the legislation you know the legislation is significant but it is you know it is one part of that process and alongside this legislation we are conducting a review of a social partnership working right across government and beyond to give us greater clarity and consistency and also to recognise the capacity of partners to be part of this process to make sure that we better kind of engage and better link across that and we will also be working very closely with partners such as the Wales TUC and also partners from the um, employer representatives as well to make sure that um, that is done in the way that brings those broader benefits that you want to see and I'd very much you know welcome conversations with colleagues in the chamber about actually how we can do that and to be part of that as we move things forward alongside this significant legislation. Thank you. Uh, York, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I very much welcome the statement from the Minister. Procurement is one of the most powerful tools the Welsh Government has, has got in order to de decide the type of Wales we're going to have. There is a very large procurement programme, not just by the Welsh Government, but by all the whole of Welsh Government funded public sector, including health and local government. I, like many members here, are massively opposed to fire, the use of fire and rehire, exploitative contracts and paying less than the real living wage. Will the Welsh Government use procurement to rule out companies that use fire and rehire, pay less than the, re the real living wage and uh, use exploitative contracts from all Welsh Government and Welsh Government funded bodies contracts and also, more importantly, the subcontracts. No one who is getting a penny of money from the Welsh taxpayer should be running companies and should be exploiting the workers who are doing the work for it. I thank Mike Hedges for his contribution. I know this is something which you demonstrate then, but I know it's something you've raised time and time again. And, and like myself and many others in this chamber and beyond, feel very passionately about actually how we use all the levers we do have at our disposal, at our devolved disposal in Wales, to, to make a difference when it comes to fair work. And of course, you know, fair work spans both. Uh, devolved and non-devolved areas which impacts you know what we can do and how we can do it and I'm clear that this bill respects and and, and uh, recognizes where our, how far you know where what we can do in in this space but um, you know this is the first piece of legislation on procurement that we've actually developed in in Wales so it, it will enable us to put existing good practice and socially responsible procurement on a on a statutory footing but will also put us in a position to strengthen that as well and as I go back to what I said to previous contributions that um, the statutory guidance that we can work that works on that around not just looks at fair work but the broader well-being objectives too to get that balance right in terms of actually you know things like the financial economy fair work as well to make sure we have those um, we are supporting those public bodies too to actually to simplify the process for them in the first instance but to make sure that we get it right in terms of the, the social value that we want to achieve from it and you know this government is absolutely committed to every using every lever we do have at our disposal to to achieve that and just on the point Mike Hedges makes on kind of subcontracting and, and supply change and specifically one of the reasons why in this first instance that the legislation seeks to legislate on the face of the bill around the construction sector in particular because as I said we know that there you know the members in this chamber who have been part of those codes of practice we've 
put in place previously or campaigned for from the outside around ethical employment in supply chains or um, umbrella um, employment options, which you know is something um, that has been common, unfortunately, all too common within the construction sector. So it does a, this legislation, the procurement, the contract manager seeks to go some way to address that and also address actually how that, that fits down throughout the supply chain as well. Jenny Rathbone. Uh, thank you. Um, and, uh, Minister, I very much look forward to um, scrutinising uh, this bill at uh, stage one in the Equality and Social Justice Committee. I think it's a very exciting bill. Um, I wanted to look at the public procurement aspects um, and particularly the reporting duties on public bodies and Welsh ministers in relation to socially responsible procurement. And I just want to query why only socially responsible procurement, uh, because the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act obviously isn't just about social responsibility. And as public bodies prepare to invest many millions of pounds, quite rightly, in the healthy eating habits of of children as we roll out the Universal Free School Meals Programme, um, what role do you expect this bill to play in ensuring that this particular additional procurement strengthens a prosperous, cohesive and resilient Wales, fundamental to the foundational economy objectives, as well as, of course, making an important contribution to a healthier Wales? I thank Jenny Raffan for her contribution. I very much look forward to uh, the work that you will do as a welcome what you will do as a committee to quite rightly scrutinize this legislation but also to um, to, to work with us as we develop it and, and move things forward and I, I really very much welcome your contributions in terms of um, recognizing the, the value that this legislation potentially brings and and another person who is excited about procurement as well in the in the chamber today um, in terms of you know just to try and clarify the point you make around why socially responsible procurement. Well, actually, the, the, the bill sets out duties on, on the public bodies as specified, um, which are referred to as contracting authorities. So it's called socially responsible procurement, but it ensures that when procurement is undertaken, there is consideration of social, economic, cultural and environmental well-being. And there are duties set, further due to concerning contract management and transparency. So as I said previously, that's why you know, it's socially responsible procurement and we're talking about wellbeing and it's fair work, but it goes more broader than that to capture the points that the member made there. Um, so the work will be around the statutory guidance, but actually how we can you know, work with members, work with colleagues across the floor and with our social partners to ensure that um, we are getting that balance right in terms of actually where that social value is placed and how we can support those public bodies to make sure that we are achieving what we need to achieve. But socially responsible procurement is, you know, I'm sure it's something we can discuss further in, when we come to committee, but also in terms of if the member it would be helpful, I'm more than happy to write to provide further clarification in terms of what that would encompass and what the intention is behind that. I can order Joyce Watson. Uh, uh, and I thank you uh, for the statement today, uh, Deputy Minister, and I want to completely disassociate myself with the comments of Joel James and his anti-trade union uh, stand and accusing them of all sorts of uh, unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated statements, and I'm a proud member of a trade union uh, myself. So I do welcome uh, this uh, bill. Uh, it is a key component of a wider push to make uh, work in Wales much fairer, and it's a timely intervention too when Tory taxes, benefit cuts and economic mismanagement are increasingly eroding pay and pensions across the board. And as always, the constructive model of social partnership here in Wales uh, is in direct contrast with the Tories' failed confrontational approach and they're currently picking fights with rail workers as they have uh, with teachers and junior doctors in the past. So um, my question uh, to you, uh, Deputy Minister, is when we're talking about uh, procurement and social partnerships, which you are here, that we will fully engage with everybody. And also I want to reinforce the question that uh, Mike Hedges uh, asked previously that anybody that benefits from public funds in Wales uh, both uh, looks after the staff but more importantly that we keep the majority of that money here in Wales as well. Thank you. Can I thank Joyce Watson for 
the contribution. I know it's something you've particularly been involved with, particularly within the construction sector too, in terms of tackling um, unjust and unfair work practices. And I know you've worked both with myself and, and colleagues in terms of actually how to take forward codes of practice around this. And so this, this legislation seeks to to strengthen the work that's gone before by the first time putting, you know, legislating around procurement and how we strengthen not just socially responsible procurement, but, you know, go back to what we said previously around those, um, using all the levers we do have at our disposal whilst recognising the constraints of the current devolution settlement, but using kind of the power of the public to, 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 to leverage, um, particularly in those sectors like construction and also around, more broadly, around socially responsible procurement, which encapsulates fair work as part of that. Mae item pedwa ar y gendel wedi ei thynnu yn ôl, felly symud ymlaen i item 5, ddatganiad gan y gwynid o geachud a gwasanaethau cymdeithasol, diweddariad y fwrdd iechyd Prifysgol Betty Cadwallader, a galwaf ar y gwynid o Lynyrd Morgan. Diolch, Dyr Prwylywydd. Further to ongoing concerns at Betty Cadwallader University Health Board, many of which have been raised in this chamber, I asked the Chief Executive of NHS Wales to hold an extraordinary tripartite meeting on the 26th of May as a part of the NHS Wales escalation framework. The situation in Betsy is unacceptable and it needs serious work and efforts to correct. Services are not as good as they should be and we are determined to improve the situation for the thousands of people in North Wales who rely on these services. Following the tripartite meeting between Welsh Government, Healthcare Inspectorate Wales and Audit Wales, the NHS Chief Executive has recommended that the targeted intervention status at Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board should be extended beyond mental health and governance issues to incorporate a sputty gland cloid, focusing in particular on the vascular service and emergency department in Aspati gland cloid, and I have accepted that advice. They did not suggest that we put Betsy back into special measures. We will therefore ensure that significant new, additional, external, clinical and practical expertise will be put in place to ensure that we embed sustainable change and improvements in the quality of the service. In this way, we'll be making improvements with the Health Board rather than doing things to the Health Board. The decision has been made in line with the escalation framework and reflects serious concerns about the leadership, governance and progress that have been a feature of a sputty gland cloid. My decision has been communicated to the Chair of the Health Board. Firstly, let me address the issue of governance leadership and oversight of a sputty gland cloid. It's clear the current challenges facing a sputty gland cloid require a focused intervention to support cultural change and promote leadership at all levels. I have therefore instructed Improvement Cymru, the Improvement Service for NHS Wales, to work with the Health Board to bring in external, clinical and organisational development expertise into the hospital. The aim of Improvement Cymru is to support the creation of the best quality health and care system for Wales so that everyone has access to safe, effective and efficient care in the right place and at the right time. I want to emphasise that this in no way reflects on the hard work of the staff in Asputi Gland Cloyd but this is a source of external help and support to embed the change which is needed urgently and we need to do this at pace. Secondly, vascular services have been challenged since the service was centralised. This does not mean that decision, the decision to centralise was wrong. Following a series of concerns raised by the Royal College of Surgeons and Health Inspectorate Wales, the Health Board has responded rapidly and progress has been made in a number of areas, but the service remains fragile. There have been some serious incidents over the last few months, and the benefits of the recent changes have not yet been realised. A new clinical leader has been appointed, but has yet to take up post. 
My officials will continue to monitor the implementation of the action plan at least twice a month. Thirdly, the emergency department at Aspetti Glancloyd has been designated a service requiring significant improvement by Health Inspe Healthcare Inspectorate Wales. We have made £3 million available to the Health Board for the local six goals for urgent and emergency care programme. I have instructed clinical leads from the national programme to work closely with the Health Board to address the concerns identified by HIW. Fourthly, mental health. This service is without doubt in a much better state than the one which went into special measures. But whilst progress has been made, there is still much more to be done, particularly around culture change, and this will take time. Following discussions with the Deputy Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing, I'm asking the Health Board to move with pace to ensure that there is a permanent leadership team in place and to develop a robust recruitment plan to minimise vacancies and the use of interim staff. We must make this a sustainable service. I've asked Welsh Government officials to commission an independent assessment of the sustainability of the progress that has been made against the various mental health reviews over recent years, and ministerial oversight of these arrangements will be led by the Deputy Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing. In all of my wedi dod i'r amlwg, my systeme adweithiol ar y cyfan sydd gan y bwrdd iechyd ar hyn o bryd. Mae adolygiadau allanol wedi tynnu sylw at fylchau sylweddol mewn elfennau sylfaenol o safonau gwasanaethau clinigol. Mae hyn yn cynnwys cadw cofnodion, rheoli digwyddiadau, gweithio fel tîm, adrodd ar bryderon, ar weinyddiaeth a moral. Mae llawer o brosesau neu lle, ond os dim digon o gapasiti ynddynt a dyn nhw ddim yn ddigon eang, i gynnig sicrwydd yn y meysydd hyn ar draws y system gyfan. Mae'n rhaid i'r bwrdd iechyd ddod yn sefydliad sy'n gallu gwella i hunan, gyda staff clinigol sydd ar sgiliau i gynnal gwelliant parhaus wrth eu gwaith o ddydd i ddydd. Rhaid i'r pwyslais hwn fod yn amlwg drwy'r sefydliad cyfan o'r ward i'r bwrdd. Dwi'n gofyn i'r bwrdd iechyd gwneud y pethau canlynol. A dylygu eu trefniadau parasennol o ran llywodraethiant, archwilio ac effeithlonrwydd a gweithio gweda gwelliant Cymru i fydd soddi mewn rhaglen addysg a chymorth a fydd yn cael eu rhoi ar waith yn gyflym er mwyn gwella sgiliau. Dwi hefyd wedi gofyn i'r bwrdd iechyd sicrhau bod penodiad ar lefel uwch yn cael ei wneud i swydd cyfarwyddwr diogelwch a gwella. Bydd yr unigol ein hwn yn cefnogi'r cyfarwyddwr gweithredol nyrsiwn newydd i sicrhau bod gwelliannau a threfniadau llywodraethiant ar y cyd yn cael eu rhoi ar waith ar draws y bwrdd iechyd. Ar ben hyn, mae rhaid i'r bwrdd wneud yn well wrth feithrin a chynnal cysylltiad a'i staff a'r cyhoedd. Mae nifer o bryderon wedi cael eu godi am les y gweithlu, achosion o aflonyddu, bwlio a staff yn teimlo na allent godi eu llais. Mae'n rhaid i'r bwrdd adeiladu ar y gwaith sydd ar y gwaith yn barod o ran datblygu sefyldiadol a rhaid iddo wneud hynny'n gyflym. Gan gadw mewn cof am o'r ddifrifol ac eithriadol i'w'r trefniadau i'wch gyfeirio hyn, fe fyddan nhw'n cael eu monitron agos a'i odolwg i'n fian er mwyn sicrhau bod cynnydd yn cael eu wneud. Bydd cyfarfod tair ochr arall yn cael eu gynnal cyn diwedd mis hydref y lenni. Dyr prylywydd mae hon yn gyfres helef a phellgyrheiddiol o ymrwymiadau wedi targedu ar gyfer bwrdd iechyd prifysgol Betsy Caldwaladr. Byddwn yn cadw golwg cyson a chadarn ar y rhain dros y misoedd nesaf. Rhaid i mi bwysleisio bod gwaith gwych yn cael ei wneud mewn ambell fan y mwrdd iechyd Betsy Caldwaladr. Yr hyn sydd ei angen nawr yw bod yr ansawdd hwnnw yn cael ei ailadrodd ar draws y system gyfan a hynny'n fwyaf penodol yn ysbyty glan clwyd. Ond yn bwysig ach fyth, mae hon yn gyfres o drefniadau a fydd yn cefnogi'r bwrdd iechyd ar ei daith i barhau i wella, fel y gall pobl y gogledd fod yn falch o'i gwasanaeth iechyd lleol. Diolch.
Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you, uh, Minister, for uh, your statement, although I have to say I'm disappointed by the lack of courtesy which you've extended to members of the Senate who have a direct interest in the hospital uh, to which your statement has referred. Um, as you will know, I've taken a great interest in the services at Glancluid Hospital for many years, and yet you didn't even give me the courtesy of a briefing uh, before your statement this afternoon, and nor did you give other members uh, who represent that hospital the courtesy of a direct briefing either. You say that this is targeted intervention, but nothing could be further from the truth. It's a scattergun approach that you are now taking in North Wales. We have targeted intervention already for mental health services, for strategy, planning and performance, for leadership, including governance, transformation and culture, and for engagement because of the poor engagement with patients, public, staff uh, and stakeholders. Yet today you've announced even more targeted intervention, this time at Aspity Glancluid, in respect of its leadership, which is already in targeted intervention, we are told, uh, its mental health services, which are already in targeted intervention, or so we're told, uh, and, of course, its vascular services now uh, and emergency uh, department. And I have to say, long overdue in terms of intervention required uh, for those. Yeah. These services, some aspects of these services, which you say you are now putting into targeted intervention, have been in special measures or targeted intervention for seven years. Seven long years. In fact, the seven-year anniversary is this week that mental health services have been in special measures. This week. And it's the same with the leadership issues. And yet, time and time again, we have ministers here, including your predecessors, who come and say, we're determined to get things changed, we're determined to kick things into shape, we need to move things on with pace. You know, that word with pace seems to make all the difference in your ministerial statements, doesn't it? Well, the reality is it doesn't. When does targeted intervention on such a wide number of things actually become special measures? Because I don't know, and I don't think it's very clear uh, to the public either. You said that if there was not improvement in vascular services within three months, you, would, uh, you threatened to, that the health board would face consequences. Well, if this is the only consequence they are facing, another special measures, uh, another targeted intervention label, I don't think they've got much to be concerned about. Uh, frankly, because we know that targeted intervention doesn't work, hasn't worked for seven years, as I've already uh, said. Now, if you've got a leadership of a health board that is absolutely incapable of making improvements, why aren't you moving that leadership on? Why are you saying that we now need to appoint another executive director at huge cost to the taxpayer, this time for safety and improvement. Why can't the extremely highly paid executive team already in place at the health board deliver the improvements that they are employed to do? That is their job. And if they're not up to it, they can ship out and go somewhere else because we don't want them in North Wales. We want a team that works, that delivers the improvements that we've been promised because people are being let down, patients are being let down, the staff are being let down with the appalling working environment that many of them are having to endure as a result of this dysfunctional health board that you as a Welsh Government have also been incapable of turning around over all this time. You talk about the emergency services at Glancluid needing intervention, and they do, but what about elsewhere in North Wales? What about down the road in uh, Wrexham Myler Hospital? That hospital's actually had worse emergency service uh, department performance uh, over the past 12 months. In eight out of the past 12 months, it's had worse performance figures than Glancluid Hospital. So why have you left that out of this targeted intervention approach? You talk about a bullying culture. You talk about staff not being listened to. You talk about a culture of fear. We heard reports about the situation in Aspity Gwynedd, uh, with staff there complaining about those things just a couple of weeks ago. Why isn't that hospital being put in targeted intervention uh, for these uh, things? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You now tell us you're going to work with the health board rather than work for the health board in order to sort these problems out. And you've appointed Improvement Cymru as though it's some white knight on a horse that's going to ride in and turn this situation around. Why on earth haven't you deployed Improvement Cymru before? This organisation's been in place for years, and yet you haven't deployed them up until today. 
Why don't you use the experts that are out there to turn the situation around? Why not call the Royal College of Emergency Medicine in to turn around the emergency departments in North Wales? Why not call in you know, the, the, the Royal College that did the reports on the vascular services to actually come in and turn that situation around? Because they know best, I would suggest, uh, in my view. And I'll come to my concluding remarks uh, now, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. You say that you want to improve things with pace. And you say that this situation will be carefully monitored and reviewed, and yet you said the next tripartite meeting won't take place until the end of October. That doesn't sound like an organisation that's going to make significant improvements at pace if you're prepared to wait until the end of October for a further tripartite meeting. Minister, I have absolutely zero confidence that Welsh Government targeted intervention in these extra areas on top of the other targeted intervention is going to make any difference at all in this health board. We need to kick the current leadership out that has been failing people for so long. That's the only way to drive the significant I have been to the that we need, and we need that action now, sooner, rather than later. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I did, of course, offer a briefing to your political representative on the Health Committee, and I'm sure he communicated to you uh, what, what that, uh, that information uh, contained. Uh, there is nothing scattergun about this approach. Uh, we uh, formerly had uh, measures in relation to mental health and governance, and now we are targeting this intervention, this additional intervention, at the area where we have greatest concern, and that is on aspartic gland cloid on vascular and on the emergency department. Uh, you can't have it always. You can't tell me in one breath that it's scattergun, and now you want me to spread uh, that approach to Rex and Mailer and everywhere else. You can't have it both ways. So uh, I think this is the right way to go. This has been identified uh, by that tripartite group to uh, assess where we can make the biggest difference in a short space of time. Now, there's a difference now uh, in terms of improvement, Cymru. You're quite right. It was a question that I asked. Why didn't we bring them in, bring them in before? It was because they didn't exist until 2019. We had this short... We had, we had this little... Uh, intervening issue of COVID that actually knocked a lot of things out of action during that time. The approach uh, in terms of improvement, Cymru, was based on uh, a thousand lives. Um, now, what we have now is a very different focus for the organisation, and that's why things will be different this time. On top of that, of course, we have put significant additional resources in place. £297 million until 2024. Um, we have uh, had, of course, detailed discussions with the Chair and the Chief Executive in terms of how we can improve the situation in a practical way and to do it at pace. When you say uh, we won't be doing anything until October, if you've listened carefully to the statement, it was very clear that we would be taking the temperature on a fortnightly basis from the Welsh, Welsh Government's point of view to make sure that we see improvements on a regular basis. It will then be uh, an opportunity to bring in Health uh, Inspectorate Wales again to see if that intervention has made any difference uh, by the end of October. Diolch uh, Dipri Lywydd a uh, diolch am y datganiad am dwi'n ofni uh, dim ond sydd yn edrych ar hyn dydy am seru hyn uh, heddiw ddim yn adlewyr chi'n da ar lywodraeth Cymru a dydy gwir mae ymdangos unwaith eto gymaint o diffyg dealltwriaeth a diffyg gwerthfarogiad sydd yna uh, yn Llywodraeth Cymru ynglyn a difrifoldeb y sefyllfa y mor ddiechyd Betsi Cadwaladr. Th this is a very weak uh, response to uh, a, an extremely serious situation, uh, I fear. Uh, an extension of targeted intervention rather than a real rolling up of sleeves to deal with a problem that is causing so much anguish to staff and patients across the north. And, you know, 
an extension of targeted intervention? Why end here when there are so many problems right across Betsy Cadwallader? The problems I have brought to your attention uh, among nurses at Aspeti Gwynedd and the fears of bullying and intimidation and working conditions that are not up to it in terms of retaining uh, the staff and their knowledge and their experience. Why not include Aspeti Gwynedd? And in terms of, of the timing, you know, which one is it? Is uh, this yet another example of Welsh Government acting at the 11th hour to try to take the sting uh, out of a Senedd uh, debate and a potentially difficult uh, vote, uh, acting because they have to, to try to avoid uh, embarrassment? You know, Welsh Government does this all uh, the time. It's a government dragging uh, its heels. Or is it that the Minister really failed to register the seriousness of report after Report, that damning report on vascular in particular, when she decided to see how things went for another three months, uh, to see how things, uh, to, to, before deciding uh, on the next step, and if action was required, when it was pretty obvious uh, that we needed uh, further intervention. Uh, government failed to act in a way that reflected the urgency of the situation. Um, Mae'r gwynidog yn deud bod yna um, bocedi o'r agoriaeth uh, o fewn Betty Cadwallad yr oes mae yna. Um, I sgwennu si at y prifweithredwr ar cadeirydd yn ddiweddar, yn dilyn uh, cohoedi ffigur â'r cancer, yn dangos bod yna waith da yn digwydd uh, yn y gogledd. Dan i yn deall uh, hynny. Uh, Mae'r gwynidog dwi'n gwybod yn eiddgar i ni gadw mewn golwg yr uh, angen i gefnogi staff drwy hyn oll. A llai ddim cytuno mwy, heb staff dois na ddim NHS. Uh, yn yr adrannau yna sy'n wynebu yr heriau mawr, uh, mae yna staff dan i angen i cadw, a dan i yn cofio am dan i'n nhw heddiw ac yn diolch am ei gwaith nhw. Ond staff ydy llawer o'r heini sy'n codi pryderon efo ni am wasanaethau iechyd yn y gogledd. Staff oedd yn codi pryderon am golli gwasanaethau fasgular o Fangor. Heddiw er gweitha yr adroddiad damniol hwnnw, mae'r gwynidog yn dal i fyny bod y penderfyniad i ganoli uh, gwasanaethau wedi bod yr un cywir. Wel, os oedd o pam ddim canoli yn ysbyty gwynedd, lle oedd yna ganolfan o ragoriaeth. Ar wasanaethau iechyd, meddwl, staff sy wedi bod yn disgrifio wrth i a geilodau eraill dro ar ôl tro pan bod gwasanaethau iechyd meddwl ddim yn barod o ddod allan, uh, i ddod allan y wasanaeth o, uh, o fesurau arbennig go iawn pan benderfynodd y Llywodraeth wneud hynny yn gyn amserol cyn yr etholiad diwetha. Felly, dan i yn gwrando ar staff, dan i yn parchu staff, dan i yn ystyried y gefnogaeth sydd i angen i staff. Ond ydy'r gwynidog yn derbyn y bydd llawer o'r staff hynny yn gweld bod yna lawer gormod o oedi wedi bod cyn cymryd y cama mae heddiw a bod y cama yn anigonol. Ac yn absenoldeb mewn difri unrhyw awgrym yn y datganiad yma, os sydd fydd mesur ydy peth angwella a'u peidio, ydy hi'n derbyn yn bod ni'n dal heb weledigaeth o sydd fydda Betsy Cadwallad yr llwyddiannus gynaliadwy yn gweithio. A dyna pam yn bod ni ar y meinciau yma, uh, yn y ddadl y fory, yn dadla bod eisiau edrych yn onest ar y posibilrwydd o ail drefnu gofal iechyd yn y gogledd. Um, mae'r cynlluniau yma yn wan uh, dwi'n ofni. Dwi'n gobeithio er mwyn staff a chleifion y gwnân nhw gwahaniaeth. Uh, y gall y cynlluniau yma uh, wneud gwahaniaeth, ond mae hi'n sefyllfa ddifrifol sydd angen plan B yn barod i fynd. Um, I am extremely aware of the seriousness of the situation, uh, and it is clear that the situation in Betsy, in particular in those areas we've highlighted, is unacceptable. This is something that I made very clear to the Chief Executive and the Chair uh, when I met them last week. Uh, can I be absolutely clear that this, sta this statement was earmarked before any suggestion of an opposition debate on this matter? Uh, it was very important for me. It was important for me to, it was important for me to speak to the chair and the chief executive in uh, face to face, and that's why I needed the opportunity to go and make that. Uh, that to, to do that in front of them last week. So I'm glad that I was able to do that, to go through the detail of what we were, being, uh, what we were proposing. The three months that uh, we uh, used 
uh, to give us time to assess exactly uh, what interventions were necessary, uh, not only allowed us to, to recognise the seriousness of the situation, but also made sure that we had a clear programme of action that we could put in place. I am not in the business of putting a label on something and not having a follow-through for that label. And that's why it's absolutely clear to me that uh, making an announcement that there will be an extension to the targeted intervention with a clear programme of action to run alongside that is the right way to go. In terms of uh, the staff, I have been speaking to representatives of health unions in, in recent uh, ways, uh, days. Uh, certainly they have been uncomfortable in certain situations of uh, being moved around from, uh, from place to place. Um, but some of the unions are telling me that actually they don't recognise uh, some of the issues that have been highlighted. So uh, I would uh, suggest that if there are issues that they also talk to the unions about those issues because they are not hearing uh, some of the things that uh, are being heard uh, by members here. Um, it is important also uh, for us to make sure that we focus on the staff within the organisation. Uh, the staff are the backbone of any improvements that we are likely to see here. It is why we have said that we are going to be standing with the staff and doing, it, doing any interventions with the staff rather than doing things to them. That is the only way we're going to get sustainable change. I've had a request for a point of order. Darren Miller. Thank you, uh, Deputy Slowith. Um, can I just uh, express my concern about a remark that the Minister made suggesting that this statement has been planned for a number of weeks? I'm a member of the Business Committee. The Business Committee look at the Forward Work Programme each time we meet. Uh, the, uh, we were not notified of any changes until today in respect of this uh, statement. It was not agreed until uh, today. Papers were circulated yesterday to the Business Committee confirming this change. That suggests to me that the Minister may have inadvertently misled the Senate. And for a point of order, and I'm sure the Minister will reflect upon when the government had decided it would introduce such a statement, perhaps that, uh, that may be an issue rather than simply the business statement. Before we move on to the... I, I, if you don't mind... I, I will in a like second, to to Minister, I will in a second. But before we move on, can I remind all other contributors of the timescales, please? We have you know, already used up a large proportion of our time, so can everyone keep to their timescales, please? Minister. If you don't mind, I would like to, to respond to that. This is a statement that we've been preparing. Clearly, I did not want to put that on any agenda until I had the opportunity to speak to the Chair and the Chief Executive of the House Board. Uh, and that happened last week. And since then, uh, we've been working very hard since that meeting last Tuesday to put in place these measures. So uh, we've been working this up. You might have noticed, Darren, that actually there's been a four-day bank holiday, so maybe that is part of the reason why you haven't heard anything about it. No, the Minister has given a response. The Minister has given a response, and we will now move on to the next person, Jonathan Saunders. Thank you. Um, and I, whilst I thank you for the statement, uh, Minister, I'd like to thank my colleague Darren Miller and Green up here with more for actually calling you out on this statement, because it is, it's far too inadequate. I mean, you know, I've been here 11 years, and prior to that, I've had dealings going back over the years with uh, the Vet Sales Board under the uh, late sort of uh, Mary Burroughs when she was the chief executive. And we've had countless numbers of chief executives since. We've had countless numbers of chairs, and we've had several health ministers. And yet, the fundamental problem we have here is that this health board is going backwards. There is no improvements um, that I believe that, you, that will be forthcoming. Um, I, like other members, have undertaken numerous meetings with the chief exec, deputy chief exec, and listened to several statements here since first being elected in 2011. Um, the responses to serious case work issues you, you do need to ask the question. I did ask yeah, members to be succinct. I've got to be honest. Things you, are so bad. Janet, there's lots will, of people I who want to speak. I get to it, but it's a fact, and it's been raised by Clyde Cymru. The current model simply doesn't work. Um, I asked you two weeks ago, uh, Minister, whether we could have a meeting of North Wales members, yourself, 
the Chairman and the Chief Executive. And then we can have some full and frank discussions. Um, will you now agree to that meeting, please? That's all I have to ask. Uh, yes, I'll have to have that meeting. Speaker uh, first. The Pillowid. Well, come on. So, Sangi and Prowl, Martha Scandi Adaman and Marnie Dangos, but short left Cymru, mean round a round Mount Kilchoyf are Betsy Cadwallader. If you think Crogger are symptom, and same in the Ravel, and voice Sylvain Lol, get our Saluch, seen Sethi was an ether, our Klaus a goglet. So, how many times? Have we been here before on Betsy Cadwallader, Minister? How many times do we have to come here and, quite frankly, listen to your cut and paste statements about more targeted interventions, more new directors, more tripartite meetings? You're like a broken record. It, uh, it's, it's a statement that you and your predecessors have made in various forms, time after time, you know, month after month, for the best part of the last decade. Frontline workers in, in, in North Wales are doing heroic work. But their government is fiddling while Strong burns. Yeah. So, will you accept that the time has now come for a more fundamental consideration of how services are configured across North Wales? And look, if the conclusion is that this current model is the best that we can be, then so be it. I'll accept that. But until you as a government instigate that discussion, then you will have to be dragged back to this chamber month after month to give us more of the same excuses and more of the same guff. I believe that reorganisation at this point would be costly, it would be a distraction from the significant issues in relation to planned care, it would divert resources and my focus at the moment is on patient care. Uh, there is nothing cut and paste about this statement, I can assure you I've spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, I think that I, I will retain my focus as I'm sure the board will on ensuring that we are doing the very best for the people of North Wales, and a costly reorganisation is not the answer. Gareth Davis. Mr Deputy Clower, and thank you for your statement um, this afternoon, Minister. And the sad reality um, is that in the, back in the 1980s and the 1990s, um, Glancluid Hospital was one of the best performing hospitals, not only in Wales, but the UK. So it's sad to see um, how times have changed, to say the least. Um, I have just a couple of questions this afternoon. Um, do, do, do you honestly believe that these measures you've outlined can deliver improvements quickly and in a, in a timely manner? And what additional support will be on offer to my constituents working in uh, YGC? Um, after all, this is not a failure of the staff working on the front line. It's a leadership failure. Too many min middle managers and bureaucrats. Do you have confidence that the leadership can deliver safer, improved services? And as you state in your statement, there are concerns sur surrounding morale and workforce well-being. So what steps are you taking to monitor the well-being of the staff working in YGC? And what instruments are you going to use to, to, to measure that over a sustained period of time? And will staff at YGC be offered external reporting measures until the culture within the health board improves? And finally, Minister, you, um, you have asked the health board to create a new director of safety and improvement. Given the recruitment issues facing the board, when do you anticipate the post being filled and how will the new director be able to drive these improvements that are well needed? Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, there are some things, Gareth, that I expect to improve very quickly. I think there have already been some improvements in relation to vascular. Uh, there will be others which will take more time. The, the cultural shift that is necessary within the organisation, the acceptance that uh, it needs to be a self-improving organisation uh, is something that will not be able to be switched on overnight, but is something that where I expect to see improvements. Um, the issue that you referred to in terms of the appointment of a new director for improvement is uh, something which uh, we discussed with the chief executive and the chair uh, last Tuesday, uh, and uh, they have now gone away to think about how exactly that would work within the uh, executive organisation that they already have in place. I'm going to have Sam Lawrence. 
Uh, Deputy President Officer, and uh, thank you, Minister, for bringing uh, forward today's statement. Before I get into the thrust of my comments, I would like some clarity from the Minister around the statement that uh, bringing in improvement Cymru was only possible to do in the rounds of 2019. Well, I, I understood that the Thousand Lives campaign, which is the predecessor name, has been around for quite a long time, so perhaps you could uh, respond to that in, in just a moment. But as you stated in, in, in your statement, Minister, the, the situation uh, in Betsy Cadwalder is an, unacceptable and needs serious uh, work and effort. And that's kind of written down like it's new news. Um, but we've been saying this uh, for years, as members have already stated. And you rightly point out that many of the issues have been raised in this chamber uh, by, by members of, of, of all parties. And, and this is because we are representing residents, uh, sometimes our own family, our own friends, our loved ones, who continue to be let down by this lack of access to quality health services in North Wales, which ultimately is your responsibility and responsibility uh, of Welsh Government. My concern is that many, re many of my residents will think that it's the same talk uh, coming from Welsh Government to see uh, improvements. So I want to know, Minister, how will you personally be assured that these improvements will take place, that the people of North Wales will see the radical improvements that we need to see? Thanks very much. Just first of all, on, on Improvement Cymru, uh, so you're quite right that it was an organisation which focused before on the Thousand Lives programme, which was a safety programme to support health boards and trusts in their efforts to reduce harm, waste and variation in Welsh healthcare. And that included work on eliminating hospital-acquired pressure ulcers, uh, assessing patients for risk of DVT and ensuring the WHO Safe for Surgery checklist is implemented in every surgical theatre. Um, now, what it didn't do is this broader approach that we are talking about now, and that's what changed in 2019 when Improvement Cymru was developed in its current form. Um, you are quite right, Sam, to, to focus on the need to improve the services that are struggling. That is precisely what we are trying to do uh, with, this, uh, with this approach. Uh, I will personally be overseeing this, having my regular meetings, as I did again this morning, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, last week, I had a meeting with the chair. I had another meeting with the chair of Betsy uh, this morning. Uh, so this, there's a continuous dialogue happening between me and the chair of the House Board. Obviously, my officials will be doing the same thing uh, uh, at an executive level. Uh, and uh, I can give you my assurance that, that, that I will be intervening personally to make sure that they are keeping on track. I'd just like to say one other thing, and that is... Let's just make sure that people are aware that there are literally tens of thousands of people being seen on a monthly basis in Betsy Cadwallader who are actually getting good care. Well, we and let's not... Let's, well, they don't, and that's the point. And that's the point. I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of the fact that actually there are people who are satisfied with the support and the service that they have, are having in Betsy. Last October, the whole Senate endorsed a motion to support wholeheartedly the global fight to root out racism and racist ideology and strive towards a more equal Wales, tackling systemic and structural race inequality. And following our consultation last year, we've continued to co-design with black, Asian, minority ethnic people across Wales the actions we must take to tackle institutionalised and systemic racism. I'm therefore proud to be publishing today the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan. At its heart is a shared vision to create an anti-racist nation by 2030, where everyone is treated as an equal citizen and is enabled to thrive and prosper. The plan sets out the goals and actions that we will take over the next 24 months, covering all aspects of public life that shape and influence the experience and life chances of ethnic minority people. We want to make sure that we continue to walk in the shoes of people with lived experience and that the experiences of individuals and communities keep shaping our thinking and the decisions we make. We developed the plan by involving people and communities and in collaboration with organisations across all parts of Wales. And this will continue as we move to implementation. To provide the necessary and continuing confidence that this plan is being implemented, and I can't 
Accountability Group will be established, led by Professor Emmanuel Ogbonna from Cardiff University and Dr Andrew Goodall, Permanent Secretary at the Welsh Government. It will mainly consist of ethnic minority people and will be further strengthened by including experts by lived, of, with lived experience of racism and will benefit from evidence and insight coordinated from our recently established Race Disparity Unit. We knew that we needed to shape the goals and actions with ethnic minority people, so we made valuing lived experience one of the values underpinning how we develop the plan. And quite rightly, we were also asked to embrace the values of a rights-based approach and that of openness and transparency. Ethnic minority people's expectations are clear. They want action that makes a meaningful difference to their lives. An anti-racist approach is a fundamental shift that we need to take. Adopting an anti-racist approach requires the Welsh Government, public services and us all to be proactive in identifying and tackling systemic racism in all aspects of how Wales works. It requires us to look at how racism is built into our policies, formal and informal rules, and the way we work and involve people in the decisions that affect them, and then do something about it. This plan will play an important part in creating a united and fairer Wales for all. This is a commitment at the heart of the cooperation agreement with Plaid Cymru, sharing a determination to tackle institutionalised and systemic racism now, as racism is a pernicious feature of the lived experience of black, Asian and minority ethnic people. The agreement with Plaid Cymru also commits us to ensuring that the justice elements of the action plan are as robust as possible and address these matters with the police and the courts. We continue to work with partners from the Criminal Justice and Wales Board to develop and fully embed a collective anti-racist approach to criminal justice in Wales. We must also ensure that the experience of racism is not passed on to future generations. No one should be held back or left behind. Many people gifted their precious time and their experiences to shape the plan. Earlier today, I joined the First Minister for a stake hold a moment to thank everyone for their contribution to this work and I with many of you want to recognise the willingness of ethnic minority people to extend their trust in securing the possibility of change and in providing their leadership and sharing their lived experiences to help make this plan what it is. And I want to record my thanks to Professor Og Bonner and the Permanent Secretary as co-chairs of the steering group for this work and to all members of the steering group who have helped shape and guide this work over the last two years. The generosity of those contributions and what people were willing to share freely to bring about change was inspiring. Through this plan, we're making clear the contribution this government will take to tackle systemic and institutionalised racism. Achieving the more equal Wales wellbeing goal and an anti-racist nation by 2030 will require a collective effort Tangible improvements will come as a result of change within public services and in those in positions of power. And we do this acknowledging the immense leadership within the ethnic minority communities and leadership at all levels, as individuals, as political leaders, as community activists, as academics and as leaders of organisations. Ethnic minority people for generations have contributed to all spheres of our economy, education, social care, cultural and sport heritage, to name a few. Visionary leaders and activists like Petty Campbell worked with passion to be a good example to the rest of the world about how we can live together, regardless of where we come from or the colour of our skin. And Professor Charlotte Williams' pioneering work means that learning about the cultural heritage and ethnic diversity of Wales is now a mandatory element of our national curriculum. Many of our key services, like our health and social care services, would not be possible without ethnic minority people working in them. And during COVID-19, we would have been lost without this workforce. We are committed to provide the leadership, our resources and our influence to tackle systemic and institutionalised racism within Wales. This is a whole of government plan with commitments and actions from across ministerial portfolios and within the Welsh Government Civil Service. And this is reflected in the statements made today by the Minister for Education and Welsh Language and the Deputy Minister for Arts, Sports and Chief Whip, taking forward key actions within the anti-racist plan. We're asking everyone to work with us in creating an anti-racist Wales, a Wales in which we can all be proud to belong and in which each of us will thrive. Arthur Hussain. Oh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you, Minister, for your statement. Uh, 
Despite the Welsh Government's previous efforts to eradicate racism in Wales, the number of freshly motivated hate crimes are on the rise. It is estimated that 65% of hate crimes are racially motivated. These sorts of facts have led some to consider Wales as the most racist country in the United Kingdom. Many young people from ethnic minority backgrounds believe racism is just a part of normal life for them, and no government plan will stop the racism they receive. This is truly sad. A BBC report into racism in Wales found young people in general don't always feel safe when they leave their homes out of fear of what might happen to them. The Welsh Government plan are undermined by the reluctance of the police in Wales and England to acknowledge institutional racism within their organizations. This is despite complaints of young ethnic minorities suffering injuries during their time in police custody. Trust, is, trust in public services, including government policies, can often be heavily influenced by the relationship with enforcement agencies and services on the ground. Despite the BAME communities making around 6% of Irish population, only 3% from ethnic minorities' backgrounds are appointed to public office positions. Within the general job market, employees from ethnic minority backgrounds earn 7.5% less than their white counterparts. All these issues can have major implication on the mental and physical health of people of all ages from the ethnic minorities. The notion of the self-worth and acceptance are things we all want. For ethnic minorities, these fears are sometimes a sad reality. My question to the Minister is, the Welsh Government have made previous attempts to end racism and discrimination in Wales. With their new programme, can the Minister outline what they have done differently to prepare a plan to address the issues they have previously failed to solve? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Altaf Hussein, for your contribution and your questions. Um, I started my statement by actually referring to that debate that um, we held last year where we, the whole Senate, in fact I remember um, speaking to uh, Darren Miller about the, the motion that we all agreed, every party, as we did the year before, we did uh, support that motion to wholeheartedly uh, address that, uh, the fight to rote out racism and, and strive towards a more equal Wales. And, I think um, this plan will help us actually deliver this. We can't have a debate every year without actually the kind of change um, that you know uh, and that we know uh, that we have to address in terms of uh, the racism that does uh, blight uh, people's lives in Wales. And that's why we've been very clear that this is an anti-racist Wales action plan. And it's got a robust set of actions to help us make a real difference to the lives of people in Wales. Now, this is a leadership issue. It's a representation issue. Um, this morning, we had 300 people joined our virtual uh, uh, launch. Um, and it, there were people signing up to, for example, the uh, Zero Tolerance of Racism campaign, um, very much led by Race Council Cymru and the Wales TUC. We have people from all over Wales, North Wales Race Equality Network has played a key, um, Professor Robert Moore, key role uh, in, in, in ensuring that we have a pan-Wales uh, approach to this, as well as all of the community organisations who we funded with the community mentors in every part of Wales who actually contributed to getting these actions, these goals, into the plan. It's been developed to collaboratively together with black, Asian and minority ethnic people. And if we do get this right, then we can become truly anti-racist. We have to actually get rid of policies, systems, structures and processes that actually result in very different outcomes for ethnic minority people. And, you know, I've, I've already mentioned the fact that we have a rich contribution of black, Asian, minority ethnic people to our society. 
um, and it can be felt everywhere, in every sphere of life. But not enough has been done to ensure that all um, can play their part and to have that opportunity and that confidence that they are not going to uh, uh, face barriers um, as, they, as they grow up, go uh, through school, uh, education, opportunities. It's, I mean, it is important that we do have those goals and outcomes. It, I think you, you have actually referred to um, issues around crime and justice. Now, this is not devolved. We, I co-chair the Policing Partnership Board with the First Minister. And I think it's very important that, in, in fact, working together in terms of devolved and, and non-devolved, we're trying to address this because the Criminal Justice in Wales Anti-Racism Action Plan is, is, is alongside our Anti-Racist Action Plan is going to be crucial in terms of ensuring that our partners in criminal justice, uh, and of course we would, we would rather, we were responsible uh, for, for justice and pursuing the case and indeed for policing as this, not your party, but this chamber supported um, only a few, few weeks ago. But I think we, you will, um, when this is published, you will welcome, I'm sure, the Criminal Justice Anti-Racism Racism Action Plan, because it is those police and crime commissioners and chief constables who have agreed to take this uh, approach. And they, what they would like to see is one public service approach to advance race equality across Wales. So, I mean, I just want to say, in terms of hate crime, we fund the Wales Hate Support Centre. It's run by Victim Support Cymru, 24-7 uh, support advocacy and advice. And, and also, it's the first service in the UK to offer a national children and young person friendly hate crime uh, service. Um, and, and of course, this is uh, the campaign that actually is part of our, our Hate Hurts Wales campaign, which, which we've looked at, and it's going to help us uh, identify where we need to address issues. The campaign highlighted uh, a hugely negative impact of hate uh, crime on both victim, victims and their own lives, and also refer, referred to the bystanders who, um, uh, who actually do, do not call out the racism that we all know about. Uh, I think it's important that we do see uh, that race hate crime is recorded in Wales and uh, that our national hate crime statistics did show an increase, uh, but it also highlights why our work in this area is, is needed and that's why our hate crime in schools it was, the project is so important, our community cohesion programme as well. So, you know, this is where we feel that Wales will lead the way with our anti-racist action plan and we want you to be part of this. And I'm sure you will be. John Williams. It's a sad fact, isn't it, that it took a global pandemic and a movement ignited by a horrific murder in the US, that of George Floyd, to open the eyes of many in Wales to the blatant truth of race inequality and its devastating and too often deadly consequences, a truth lived by thousands of Welsh, black, Asian and minority ethnic people, an everyday experience of living with prejudice, with disadvantage, with fear. So many reports, so much research, which many of us have quoted here in numerous debates, has demonstrated this truth and shown why the approach and implementation of previous strategies were not sufficient. The aims, the aims of the Anti-Racist Action Plan are without question welcome, and Plaid Cymru is proud to have been part of the work of forging the plan through our cooperation agreement with the Government. Hearing Professor Ogbona speak about the groundbreaking approach of the plan at the launch this morning was a moment I won't forget. It made clear the potential of Wales as a nation to take an independent lead such as this in social justice. The sharpened focus within the plan on the need to actively tackle structural and institutional racism is vital if we are to see real and long-standing change. The institutional racism within organisations and overarching societal systems which result in inequitable outcomes and extend beyond the prejudice that can be more easily identified and rooted out. I welcome the acknowledgement in the plan that we must do things differently if we want to see different 
different results, and the need for goals to be set, be reviewed and monitored better to ensure agile, robust, tangible actions which will have a real effect on people's lives. Given that implementation has been identified as a major failing in past strategies, what will ensure accountability and transparency around the plans, measures and goals? Will the Minister ensure that the feedback of the external accountability group, for example, is made public in regular reports to the Senate? How will the voices of ordinary people, ordinary communities, continue to be heard now that this plan has been published? By 2030, by 2030, the plan aims for our nation to be free of that hatred which scars, oppresses and defers dreams. We must recognise that it is not enough to ensure that the structural racism that exists in our society is eliminated. We must stop it from taking root in the first place. And it starts, I think, with our youngest citizens who represent our future. The requiring of reporting of racist incidents and harassment in school and colleges through strengthened data collection is most welcome, therefore. But I'd like to understand why this will take until a year next September to change. The recent terrible and terrifying case of racist bullying of Raheem Bailey has shown the urgent need for tackling this problem in our schools. And without adequate, adequate reporting, we are tackling this issue blind. So what does the plan say to young people who could be maimed and scarred for life by these terrible experiences, who cannot wait for the effects of the new curriculum to educate and enlighten their peers, and for over a year to pass before the whole school systems are put in place to begin the process that can affect real systemic change? One of the measures to ensure that high quality, consistent further education and adult learning is in place to meet the needs of immigrants, refugees and asylum seekers is to commission a review of the ESOL policy. Given the plan's recognition of the need to remove the barriers to Welsh medium education for minority ethnic people, should this also include free Welsh language lessons? The aim of increasing the number of minority ethnic people in public positions and elected office is also one vital to achieve anti-racist institutions and systems. The plan includes a measure to expand the access to elected office fund for the next local government elections in 2027. So why doesn't the plan include measures to increase ethnic diversity and representation as a part of the forthcoming Senev reform measures? And will the government advocate for doing this for the next Senev elections? Finally, the plan rightly places a firm focus on the criminal justice system as an area in which there is racial injustice as regards its treatment of and outcomes for people from ethnic minorities. We know this in part due to the research of the Wales Governance Centre and others. So can the Minister provide an update on what additional research work is required to ensure the plan delivers the required actions that should be taken in line with the aims of the plan and the commitment in the cooperation agreement? The plan states it is only when we have full oversight of the justice system in Wales that we will be able to fully align its delivery with the needs and priorities of minority ethnic communities of Wales and that devolution of the police and justice system is the most sustainable way of creating a justice system that is anti-racist and fully meets the diverse needs of the people in Wales. This surely must be the ultimate aim of the plan. In the words of Coretta Scott King, it doesn't matter how strong your opinions are. If you don't use your power for positive change, you are indeed part of the problem. To truly tackle the hate and injustice that plagues, hampers and shames our society and the systems which permit this, we must be united in using the power we have to take the power we need. Dear. And thank you for such powerful statements, which uh, indeed shows just the strength of the coming together in our cooperation agreement about the importance of strength, um, which I believe could come from across this chamber, but it has to be delivered as a result of our, commi our joint commitment and sharing of our goals and values um, in the cooperation <coughs> agreement. And I, you know, I think it's, uh, it's important that it is expressed and publicly clear as a high-profile commitment uh, the anti-racist Wales Action Plan of both our programme for government and the cooperation 
agreement. And, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that we've had productive discussions, you've had an opportunity to review the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan, and actually you've influenced the fact that crime and justice particularly um, are being addressed. And I have responded to, to some of those points in terms of our, our determination to, even though it isn't devolved and we are moving with, our just, uh, with the, the Justice for Wales, uh, the Thomas Commission, but also our recent uh, jointly um, signed report by uh, myself and the Council General, that we are progressing this in terms of the opportunities that we have to influence the justice system in Wales. I think uh, the, the, the importance really that, uh, that you focus on a number of, of areas of, of policy is crucial, but it has to be about leadership. We decided as a result of the consultation, extensive consultation, that race equality action is not enough. It has to be very clearly stated as, as an anti-racist action plan. And we have to, and people have to embrace the rec and recognise, as we do in government, the institutionalised and systemic racism um, that uh, actually holds people back and affects every minute of, of every day of their lives. We've learned this from working with our, 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 the, the, the people who we've worked with in terms of the steering group, the Wales Race Forum, which actually I've been working with for many years, who, who called for this to be an action plan, not another strategy, um, but a plan with those goals and actions to take forward. So leadership um, within Welsh Government and across the public sector is crucial, the zero tolerance of racism throughout the public sector. And also, only two and a half years ago, we launched the um, Diversity and, Equal uh, and Equality Strategy for our public appointments. It was called Reflecting Wales in Running Wales. Well, we know we have a long way to go to reflect Wales in Running, in running Wales, but if we can see that change in two, by 2030, we, can, we have power over this. We can make those changes. Um, but you need goals and actions to do this, and we need to remove the barrier, and we need to use all the levers that we've got. Um, there are many issues relating to education. I know the Minister for Education and Welsh Language will be um, making and responding to in his statement. But we have remit letters, we have financial arrangements, and importantly, as you said, we have a new accountability group. You have heard about that this morning. Professor Emmanuel R. Bonner, who could help take us to this point, uh, co-chairing with his permanent secretary has made it clear right from the start we need that accountability we need a new accountability group and I can assure you that I will make sure that we feed back to the Senate um, and I know that they will want to feed back I'm sure to committees and to, to the Senate as well um, what their expectations are we'll take actions to tackle racism in terms of monitoring um, actions annually through the uh, accountability group, but it won't be just for us. Actually, someone said this morning, I think um, it, uh, one of the speakers said, this is about community accountability as well. It's about accountability of all those public sector bodies. Uh, and that, of course, includes all the statutory bodies, but also business as well. So chairs of public bodies will be pressed to proactively champion diversity and inclusion including a performance objective around anti-racism. I, I mean, I think it's very, uh, also very important just to look at uh, some of those wider issues that, that you raise. Um, I mean, for example, in terms of the hate crime um, that, and victim support centre, I've already mentioned in terms of children and young people that we've now got a, a, a new team working to address hate crime. Um, as far as Senate reform is concerned, I'm really pleased that there was, uh, you know, that it, we can learn from that in terms of the special purpose committee report, which we'll be debating tomorrow. Because of that uh, recommendation, there should be a further inquiry into the merits and implications of quotas, for example, for characteristics other, other than gender. And, and uh, we have a lot to learn, um, but we could lead the way in, in the UK, and we could certainly help lead the way in terms of looking at these issues and I know that there's uh, strong support for that and that local government now we've gone through the elections I'll be meeting uh, local government all local government leaders uh, very shortly to talk about the anti-racist action plan uh, one of the recommendations that came finally at Deputy Lowith from the uh, socio-economic report on the impact of, of coronavirus on black, Asian, minority, ethnic people was that we needed a race disparity unit 
in the Welsh Government. Well, we've got one now. Uh, it was set up, and we, it, uh, it's part of an equality evidence unit. But there is an issue about data, particularly data which is held by the UK Government. Um, and so the Wales Governance Centre has done some pioneering work, particularly led by Robert Jones, um, who, who's actually exposed disproportional impact of criminal justice, on, particularly on black, um, black Asian minority ethnic people and, and women. Well, we are going to, again, address that through work together. We met just a, a couple of weeks ago to talk about the ways in which we can work together with the Wales Governance Centre and the Equality, Race and Disability Evidence Units um, and a commitment to, to sharing uh, the justice element of the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan so that as part of, the, of our cooperation agreement with, with, with Plaid Cymru and to start a conversation now about how we can work together and, and indeed look to other research that will be um, helpful to this. So, I mean, your commitment, your support is crucial for us to get this right. But you will have heard and seen this morning um, that there will be expectations, and that expectation on us as a government has to be the key point. And I know that you will hold us to account. They, the people with lived experience of racism, must and will hold us to account, and that's what we need to deliver on the anti-racist action plan. I can all have Joyce Watson. Uh, and I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to speak in, in, at this statement today, and I really, really do welcome it. If we're going to look, and this plan is, at international, uh, in, ending institutional racism and system, systemic uh, racism, then we clearly have to tackle uh, those uh, institutions where we find the prevalence. And, of course, that will be in education, it will also be in health. We have seen the inequality uh, within the system of women's health that came forward uh, in, under COVID, which has already been uh, mentioned just now. Uh, and we have to look at sport. Uh, we all know that uh, in terms of football, um, uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic players are heroes when they are scoring. But should they miss a penalty or something, the racial abuse that they suffer afterwards is somewhat appalling. Um, so we have to look at the positives that, are con uh, that the contribution that is made. We have to change the narrative and we have to, without a doubt, uh, move forward uh, with that at all levels. We have to change minds, in my opinion, by changing the narrative. And the narrative all too often is one of being negative rather than being positive. So I really do welcome this. And I'm minded here today, we talk about me, you, other. We need, need to start to talking about us. Uh, and that is all of us. Welcome about uh, Joyce Watson. And uh, you've absolutely made it spelled it out so clearly, this is about ending institutional racism and therefore we have to look at those institutions, including our own, um, and tackle that. I will leave it to the Deputy Minister. I'm sure she will be addressing the questions, particularly in her portfolio uh, around uh, sport uh, and the Education Minister. On ed we, we actually, on education, we thought it would be good to have several statements, not just, this is not just for the Minister for Social Justice, the whole, indeed every Minister could be standing up and making a, sta a statement today because it's re relevant to every Minister and you'll see that in the Action Plan. But just quickly on health, um, I've already mentioned the, you know, the contribution, the role, um, the experience of the health and social care workforce um, in terms of the the, the role that they play, but not just in the pandemic, but always in our health service. But they, we have expo they exposed to us the inequities um, in the workforce, um, and time, time again, time and again, recognising that this is something where you know they haven't, they haven't al always been recognised, had a level playing field in terms of their opportunities. So it is good that the Minister for Health is establishing an NHS Health Inequalities Group. Um, I mean, this is going to particularly draw on lived experiences to identify the barriers black, Asian, minority, ethnic people uh, have experienced in accessing health services. 
Uh, and obviously, you know, this is issues which we've been discussing in terms of access for, for women's health. This is very intersectional uh, in terms of the anti-racist action plan. Uh, so we, we, we need to ensure that we have anti-racist leadership and education in NHS Wales at every level, in every board. Um, and we have to, it goes back to data, underpin this with data collection so that we have an evidence base for our progress. Do a a Hannes, do a a ethnic. A gal of and I'd like to uh, thank the Minister for Social Justice for her statement announcing the publication of the Anti-Racist Wells Action Plan. Now, for, for my part, I'm committed to delivering the goals and actions set out for culture, heritage and sport, which focus on the themes of leadership, funding, celebrating cultural, diverse, cultural diversity, the historical narrative and learning about our cultural diversity. The ambitious actions under these key areas are informed by lived experience. They aim to be transform transformational, delivering demonstrable change and leading to equal outcomes for black, Asian and minority ethnic people. We have a rich and diverse culture and heritage in Wales. Our programme for government commits to properly represent and reflect the history of black, Asian and ethnic minority people, aims to ensure their immeasurable contribution is recognised and to enable equal access and participation. This will improve outcomes for all and will better reflect and promote a multicultural, vibrant and diverse Wales, which is fundamental to delivering our vision of a truly anti-racist Wales. Delivering this change has already begun. In the last financial year, we undertook initial preparatory work, investing nearly £350,000 with organisations including the National Library of Wales, the Archives and Records Council Wales and the Race Council Cymru. Our national organisations play a critical role in addressing inequality and achieving an anti-racist Wales. This is a shared objective for all sponsored bodies in my portfolio and supporting the action plan is a key deliverable within their new remit letters. Now I've expressed my desire for our cultural sponsored bodies to work in collaboration to increase their um, impact in this area. Members will be aware that the Arts Council of Wales and Amgwythkova Cymru, the National Museum of Wales, have co-produced a widening engagement action plan with actions now embedded into both organisations' operational and strategic equality plans. People's Collection Wales, a federated partnership between Magwetho Cymru, the National Library for Wales and the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historic Monuments of Wales, has published a charter for decolonising the collection. Of course, while collaboration between organisations is important, collaboration and co-production with ethnic minority communities themselves is crucial to developing this work and implementing change that will have a real impact. I'm pleased to see that our organisations focusing on this, for example, the Arts Council of Wales, has undertaken a major review of its Arts Associates programme and recruited new associates with lived experience of cultural and ethnic diversity, as well as an agent for change. As a result, a cultural shift is already happening in discussions at funding meetings, with an increase in the number of successful applications targeting diverse communities and artists. And Gwedfa Cymru and the National Library are appointing, to, are appointing to roles focusing on engaging with black, Asian and ethnic minority people. The National Library and the Archives and Records Council Wales, funded by Welsh Government, have created a toolkit to enable the sector to engage better with black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. We provide funding to the Race Council Cymru to carry out a pilot project to, to develop its Black History Wales programme including the record of stories right across Wales. Six culturally diverse people, each with black history expertise and trusted community engagement experience, led the development of Black History Wales networks in different parts of Wales. 
I attended the launch of Black History Cymru 365 in October last year and saw for myself the powerful Windrush Cymru exhibition. I made a statement in January to update on the progress of the audit of commemoration, and I'm pleased to say that this work has been continuing at pace. CADU is preparing guidance for local authorities and other public bodies to support them in making decisions about public commemoration, both historical and in the future. Development of the guidance has been informed by a series of workshops with a, range of, uh, with a wide range of stakeholders. There will be a full public consultation on a draft later this year. CADU has, always been working, has also been working on improving its website, recognising a more diverse range of stories that contribute to the histories of Wales. It's worked in partnership with several organisations to create content, including personal heritage stories and creative responses to commemorating people of black heritage in Wales. The new content will be available from mid-June. Our local cultural sectors also have a vital part to play. There are over 100 local museums across the country, all working at a grassroots level. Last year, 41 museums took part in the innovative training and support programme that we funded, the first of its kind in the UK. This included workshops on looking at collections from new perspectives to enable stories connected to slavery and the empire to be told from a local perspective. Feedback from, from participants was overwhelmingly positive, with many reporting that they had gained the understanding, knowledge and confidence to make change. Since the programme ended, we know that many have found new connections in their collections and are starting to reinterpret their displays. And I'm proud of the significant progress that we have already made, and I look forward to our continued progress as we deliver our goals and actions in the Action Plan and the Programme for Government Commitments. And this will be supported by a further 4.25 million funding over the next three years through the launch of an innovative new grant scheme. Three distinct strands will, cover, will, be, will be covered. Our national sponsored bodies, a competitive grants process across our sectors, which I'm pleased to say we will be launching in the coming weeks, and a ring-fenced fund specifically for grassroots organisations, which we are developing at present for launch later this year. We're also preparing to recruit community mentors to work with my officials over the next year, and they will offer critical advice for the delivery of the action plan, support the development of the grant scheme and the establishment of a sector-specific lived experience advisory group. Together and at national, local and grassroots level, we will continue to deliver meaningful change for black, Asian and minority, minority ethnic people across Wales and take vital steps to making our vision of an anti-racist Wales a reality. Don Gifford. And can I thank the Deputy Minister for a statement this afternoon and highlighting how important it is uh, that our cultural sector and our heritage sector is as welcoming as possible for as many people as possible. And it's important that the work the Minister for Social Justice mentioned and that review is carried out, and I'm pleased to see it happening in your portfolio too, because as you said, um, uh, as the Minister for Social Justice said, I'm sorry, it's not just her responsibility as the Minister for Social Justice, but something that cuts right across Welsh Government. So I'm, I'm glad to see this piece of work is, is happening. Um, I'm also thankful to hear from your statement about that cultural change you mentioned in organisations that's taking place, and I think that's really welcome too. Um, can I also start by welcoming the 4.25 million in additional funding announced over the next three years, which will give funding for grassroots organisations, and I'm hopeful it will deliver change uh, and building on our rich and diverse culture and heritage in Wales. Um, you do, however, also mention a new grant scheme that couples this, so I'd be grateful for further details on this and wonder whether you can provide clear expectations on what you would expect from those organisations. What, in your view, does success look like? What metric can we use to hold you accountable to ensure that this new funding is providing value for money? Um, I'd also like to focus on some of the points uh, in the anti-racist anti Wales Action Plan published by the Welsh Government earlier today as it relates to your portfolio. 
under the Culture, Heritage and Sports section. It stated one of the goals is to, quote, review and decolonise our public spaces and collections by appropriately addressing the way in which people and events with known historical associations to slavery and colonialism are commemorated, acknowledging the harm done by their actions and reframing the presentation of the legacy to fully recognise this, end quote. And I agree with that. And what I think is important here is that the public at large buy into that as well. And I think most people would agree with the sentiment of that part of the plan. But what the statement I feel lacks is a definitiveness about where that line is being drawn. And it is a line that differs depending on your perspective. And it's a live debate that is happening all the time. So we've seen some people um, say that figures with perhaps tenuous links at best to the slave trade dragged into this debate years after they've passed away. I've seen some commentators mention the likes of Winston Churchill in this sort of space, which I hope we would both agree uh, is not the intention of this proposal. So this, in my view, comes down to accountability as to who will be making such decisions and what perspectives they'll be considering, because we know, as I said, those perspectives can differ. And we don't want people to, who agree with the sentiment of the action plan disagreeing with the outcome of what is actually achieved by it. Um, and a good example would be the uh, decision by the National Museum in Wales uh, a few months ago to review a replica of the first steam-powered locomotive in Wales by Richard Trevethick over claims it was linked to the slave trade. Officials at the museum admitted there were no direct links between the Trevethick locomotive and the slave trade, but they said the use of the invention is rooted in colonialism and racism. And a review is fine, but we need to be careful about where we draw those distinctions about our past to ensure that people are not deleted from our past simply because they existed in the past. Um, so an understanding on that kind of threshold would be quite important, I think. The action plan also states uh, that it will uh, identify specific ring fence resource uh, to support grassroots cultural, creative and sporting activities among black, Asian and minority ethnic groups and promote this to encourage applications to take account of intersectional disadvantages and specific issues relating to community languages. Can you, Deputy Minister, confirm exactly how that will work? How much will this pot be? And it wasn't really clear from your statement whether this would form part of the new funding announced in your statement or whether this is a separate element of funding again. And another point I'd like to mention uh, uh, was one of your actions to work with black, Asian, minority ethnic communities to identify and lift barriers to accessing heritage and cultural collections. Given this, what impact assessment has the Welsh Government done in the sorts of ways that diverse communities are facing barriers to accessing heritage sites? And can you share the findings with the Senate? Uh, another point to note in the action plan was to ask Sport Wales and its partners to increase the participation in active lifestyles of women and girls from diverse groups, taking into account intersectional disadvantages, languages, and the most disadvantaged groups. How will we be measuring that progress, Deputy Minister? And again, what does success look like? And also, what tangible targets will you be setting the, to reach whilst working with stakeholders? Um, and you also mentioned uh, with the over 100 local museums across the country, they're expected to play quite a big role, actually, in many of these schemes. Uh, such as the Charter for Decolonising the Collection, it's crucial we get that right as well. So many involved with local museums perhaps don't uh, necessarily come into regular contact with structures of Welsh Government, and many involved are volunteers. So how are you ensuring we're not placing um, an unintentional additional uh, bureaucratic work on their vital volunteering work in local museums across Wales and work out ways that we can continue to attract and enhance volunteering experiences within our museums and how also will you make sure that there's a consistent understanding within groups like this so we don't have different museums interpreting this in different ways um, and finally you talked about one of the first things you said was about the lived experience and I think that's really important there is no single diverse experience so how are you using this strategy to ensure that plurality is recognized and accounted for in this strategy thank you well, can I thank uh, Tom Gifford for those, uh, those many questions? <laughs> and I'm not sure that, I, that I've, I've got all of them, Tom, but I'll, I'll try and wrap it all up in, in, a, in an overarching uh, response. But if I can deal first with the culture grant scheme, which you were, you were talking about uh, initially. Um, I, I mean, what, what we are looking to do, really, is to introduce a scheme in readiness, readiness to launch in the coming weeks. So the detail of that is still being worked on. And I will be back in this chamber with, with more information 
uh, on that in, in due course. I, I think I've set out in my statement the kind of three strands of that, and that, that was covered in, in part of your question, but I don't have the detail of that yet. That, that is being developed, and, and we will be bringing it back. But one of the key elements of that is to ensure that some of the smaller groups who we have had quite a lot of criticism for uh, across the cultural sector, they find it very difficult to access grant funding because they are small, because they don't have the experience of, 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 of you know, having staffing that work on, on grant applications all the time and, and so on. That those kind of organisations won't find themselves in competition with big organisations that, that are coming in for, for that particular pot of money. So there will be a very specific pot, a very specific element of that fund that pot that will be aimed at, at, at those uh, other organisations. But they, they will be setting out and, and helping us to deliver what we see as very ambitious goals. Now, you know, you, want, you will ask the question, what are the ambitious goals? Well, the ambitious goals are clearly to create an anti-racist Wales. Now, I'm not going to stand here, as the Minister for Social Justice isn't standing here and saying that we can do that overnight. But we have to start with the, with the, uh, the institutions that we have some responsibility for and that we can influence and that we can work with that, that Welsh Government money goes into. So those are the, those are the organisations um, that we are working with in, in particular. I think the point that you have made around uh, decolonisation is a very fair one in terms of who do we look at, what do we, what do we say is important, and that has been very much the work of the, uh, the, the legal audit that was, it, it started a couple of years ago, when we looked across Wales at place names, monuments, um, uh, paintings, statues, whatever it might have been, that have some connection to our colonial past and, and the slave trade. Now, some of those links are more tenuous than, than others, and I think that was the point that you um, were alluding to. But I think what the legal audit was trying to do was to identify that there were a raft of people um, that we needed to acknowledge had those links. Now, those links may have been, um, as I say, may have been tenuous. Those links may not have been substantial in, in, the, in the context. I mean, you, you talked about um, Richard Trevithick, who, of course, is very important to my constituency. Uh, but, but, but I also think of people like Robert Owen, who was, was, a, was, a, was a, a great philanthropist, socialist, trade unionist, and you know, member of the, the, one of the founder members of the cooperative movement some tenuous links to the, the slave trade, which actually didn't in and of themselves um, negate all the really good work that he did. But there is an acknowledgement that there was some link because he used the, um, the, the labour of slaves in the Caribbean to bring cotton to, uh, to the UK, to Wales, to, to run his business. So we, we have to acknowledge all of that. And, and the work that has come out of the legal audit uh, with the, uh, the, 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 the group that has now been set up, which has been headed by Marion Gwynne, which is facilitating how we commemorate these people looking forward. It's not for us to determine how we commemorate them. It is for local communities and the, 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 the communities, the black, Asian, minority, and ethnic communities themselves, to be very much part of building those recommendations that we will give to public bodies and other organisations that wish to commemorate, whether it's our, our, our museums, our art galleries, our libraries, whatever it might be, if they are going to display works, if they are going to display exhibitions, if they are going to display art, if they are going to tell a story, then they have to tell a story in a context. And, and that is the work that Marion Gwynne is doing um, on behalf of uh, Welsh Government, following on from the legal audit. So it won't be for us to tell anybody how that should be done. It will be for those people to be telling us, those stakeholders to be telling us. And, and, and they will produce recommendations and that will go forward uh, uh, for public consultation so the wider public will also have the opportunity to, to have their say as far as all of that is concerned. Um, sporting aspects, I mean, what I, what I would say, uh, Tom Gifford, is I, I haven't used today's statement specifically to deal with sport. Um, there, will be, uh, there will be other opportunities for me to come back and, and deal with sport. I did concentrate my statement today, particularly on culture and heritage, 
Um, but, what, but what I would say is that you know, we, we do strongly support the work that Sport Wales is doing with UK Sport, with Sport England, with Sport Scotland and Sport Northern Ireland uh, to tackle racism and racial uh, inequalities across all four nations to develop a, a collective plan. And we're very much part of that, building that sporting community that's reflective of, uh, of the societies that, that all of our, our, our governments represent. Um, they, they are key elements of the work to eradicate racism in Wales, you're quite right. Uh, and, and, and that is all set out in their remit letters from me. Uh, and I think it's important to say, because I think it was a point that Sean had raised earlier on in terms of a accountability. All of the sponsored bodies um, that Welsh Government funds have had remit letters setting out very clearly what is expected of them. They are accountable to me for that, and in turn I am accountable to this Senate for that. And that will be the route that we will follow and make sure that that accountability is followed through and that those actions are delivered. Hello, and thank you, Deputy Minister, for your statement today. There are many things that you've outlined that I would, of course, welcome, in particular your comments in relation to the role of national organisations and local cultural sectors that they have to play in creating an anti-racist Wales. And to become anti-racist, of course, it is important that we are clear today why this action plan is so necessary. And whilst you rightly pointed out some of the things that have changed, it is clear that more action is needed and that it will take all of us working together to change this. We also need to be clear that it's not going to be easy. We've already seen some of the national institutions be challenged on their work on decolonisation, facing vile abuse online and being questioned by those that don't agree with Wales's direction here. We also need to be very clear that we are taking a different direction to England in terms of our culture and heritage and something that we should be proud of but not become complacent. It is very easy to congratulate ourselves when things are progressing, but it is very clear that Wales is anti-racist at present and that those ugly racist comments faced by organisations such, such as National Museum Wales uh, around Thomas Picton are out there. So our support here today and throughout the coming years is vital for those national institutions as they take forward this important and vital work. There is a clear emphasis in your statement about how organisations should better engage with black, Asian and minority ethnic people. But key to this, of course, is for these organisations to become more representative of Wales themselves. I'm pleased to see in the action plan in relation to culture, heritage and sport, a commitment to ensuring that more applicant applications are made by black, Asian and minority ethnic people, but crucially more appointments too, as employees and also as board members. And this is crucial if we consider some of the stats available to us in relation to public appointments, in particular within your portfolio. For instance, in 2019-20, Arts Council Wales uh, data showed there were 17 black, Asian or minority ethnic people out of 349 overall on boards of management in 39 of its regularly funded organisations. We're also aware, of course, that no one non-white applied for the role of Chair of Sports Wales. There is work for us to do in this area. And elsewhere in the plan, there are specific actions in relation to public appointment. But I want to ask specific, specifically in relation to your portfolio, Deputy Minister, do you agree that greater diversity and representation within our public bodies is necessary, not only to provide equal leadership opportunities, but to ensure the best delivery of cultural services for all citizens of Wales? I would also like to ask if the Deputy Minister is working with officials to modernise the appointment process to improve accessibility and transparency. It would be helpful to understand what progress has been made regarding the implementation of and improvements being seen as part of the Reflecting Wales in Running Wales strategy, specifically, specifically within the culture, heritage and sports sector. You also referenced in your statement something that also uh, our colleague um, referenced, that 41 local museums took part in innovative training and support programmes funded by Welsh Government. And obviously very pleased to hear that the feedback was positive from those that attended, but there is also a significant proportion of local museums that didn't participate. Why was this, Deputy Minister? Was it only open to a certain number of participants? And if not, if people chose not to attend or couldn't attend, will it become mandatory for all accredited museums to participate? 
The one concern I have from the funding announced is that some will apply and will take forward this work, but there will be some organisations in Wales left behind and not working towards realising our shared vision of an anti-racist Wales. I appreciate in your response uh, to Tom Gifford that you mentioned that this was specifically a statement around culture and heritage, but obviously, as you've acknowledged, sport is hugely important as part of this. And I would welcome a future statement specifically in relation to sport, if you would be willing to do so, Minister, because obviously this is crucial. We want people participating in every aspect of life here in Wales and for every aspect to become anti-racist. And culture and sport are so integral and intertwined. I think it's crucial that those are reflected and that we hear from you further on that matter. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, can I thank Helleth Vuckham for those points? And, and I'll, I'll start with that last one first, because, you know, although this wasn't a statement about sport, and yes, I will come back and, and deal with that, you know, sport is very, very close to my heart, particularly football, particularly after last weekend, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I'm just so excited, you know, it's just, uh, it's, you know, I, I, I get all kind of, I, I was talking to somebody last week, actually, before the game, and I was supposed to be having a business meeting with them, talking about the arrangements for the game, and I was having palpitations, just talking about, <laughs> just talking about about getting ready for the game. But, but, but you know, we, we have a huge amount to do in sport. Now, I, I, I was watching on TV the other night. There was a game, there was an international game played between England and Hungary behind closed doors because Hungary's racist, uh, uh, the, the, the racist um, crowd chanting and so on. And the game was played behind closed doors. So the Hungarian Football Association allowed 30,000 young people into that match because that was a loophole in the, in the law. When the team took the knee, the England team took the knee, the crowd of children booed. Now, you know, that is, is really frightening. 30,000 cheering, uh, uh, booing uh, a, a team taking the knee to demonstrate anti-racism. So if anybody tries to tell us that we don't have a problem, and I think, again, the point that Sean Ed was making, you know, we all know, you know, kids aren't born racist, they are taught it. They're taught that, that behaviour, and, and, if, and if we don't come in at a very early age, and I'm sure that my colleague Jeremy Miles will be dealing with this in, in his statement, if we don't start that at a very early age through our education system, then, then we, we, we're, on, you know, we're, we're, we're in very difficult uh, territory. Um, to go back to, to some of the, uh, the other uh, points that you've raised, I, I think what, what is important, particularly the areas of representation uh, in, in terms of it, access, access to our bodies, whether it is access to exhibitions so that it's, it becomes more accessible for, for people to, to, to participate in the, the viewing and the, uh, the involvement in exhibitions that we have in, in, in our museums and libraries so that it's, it's more accessible, easier to understand. That's, that's the one aspect, and that's also true of sport in terms of access to sport. But it's also about the people that our national bodies employ, the people that sit on the governing bodies, and so on. So to deal specifically with your point, we did have a report that came out of um, a, a number of, uh, of uh, uh, inquiries, uh, research that was undertaken both in the National Museum for Wales and the Arts Council of Wales, and that led to the report on the widening engagement, which was looking particularly at leadership and accountability, uh, cultural democracy, equality in the Welsh language, accessible services, work development, staff training, skills, communications and branding. So that is now running through everything that Angwethwa Cymru and the Arts Council for Wales are doing around their appointments process, appointments to their boards and so on. But you, you've quite rightly identified, uh, Helen, that, that there is still a huge amount of work to do about how do we get people to apply in the first place. And part of that widening engagement action plan is about looking at, you know, the, 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 this, this whole thing about, you know, if you, if you keep doing things the way you've always done them, you'll always get the same results. So we have to address that and we have to look more, uh, we have to look differently at that and why the the, the engagement with people with lived experiences is so important and that's why that is key and central um, to everything that, that we are doing. Uh, and, you know, again, I would have to agree with you about the, uh, the huge amount more that we still have, have yet to do. Um, I, I think further questioning needs to take place with our accredited museums about why all of them didn't take part in, in this tra 
training. And, and maybe some of that we have to look at. May, uh, you know, we, we may have to look in, in terms of what our funding, um, what our funding means to organisations that will not participate in what is, after all, a programme for government commitment. So, you know, I, I, I really just conclude by saying I, I absolutely agree with virtually everything that you have said. There is so much more to do, but I think we have set out on a path a very clear path of determination to get this right. And as I said to Tom Gifford, that, that, that accountability is to me, and it is from me back to this Senate. So I, I have, uh, you know, I've got a vested interest in, in making sure that those things are delivered as well. Thank you. John Griffiths. Oh, where is he? <laughs> Dear okay. Chloe, um, Minister, I, I was very grateful for, for your meeting with Urban Circle, um, a grassroots grassroots arts and cultural organisation um, in Newport who do a great deal of good work in the community around music, dance um, and culture to bring communities together <clears throat> and to support diversity and equality. And um, just this summer now, as, as you would know from our meeting, um, they're taking forward a very ambitious programme to have a, a reggae and rugging concerts in Newport, in Tredega House in Newport, um, which will be one of the official events to mark the 60th um, anniversary of independence for Jamaica. Um, so it'll be music, it'll be dance, they'll have a museum, um, temporary museum constructed on site, and uh, it will help very much to connect the whole of Wales really, not just the Newport area, uh, with Jamaica to a greater extent. And I know you believe, as I do, that it's very important that we make these international connections as part of our efforts to be diverse, to connect with other cultures, to understand the cultural backgrounds of people living in Wales, uh, and to get Wales out there, really, on, on the international scene to make um, Wales better known as part of our efforts to open up Wales to the world and, and the world to Wales. So I, th I think this um, event is very, very uh, important, um, Minister, and I was very pleased that um, you gave it full some back in well, when we met, because it's just one example, really, but a very strong and good one of the work that Urban Circle do in Newport, in our ethnically diverse communities, but also to make those wider connections. So I'm sure... You will join me today, Minister, in uh, applauding the work of Urban Circle, welcoming this, I think, very significant um, event uh, this summer, and wishing Urban Circle and those who work with them all the best in the future for this um, really valuable work. Yeah, well, can, can I thank John Griffiths uh, for that? Uh, that point and those those points about Urban Circle, who uh, you know they were uh, they they are a fantastic organisation. I've spoken both to you and to my colleague Jane Bryant uh, uh, about them and the work that they do. And it was it was great to meet uh, Lauren and Ali uh, when we when we discussed the, uh, the the festival that's taking place uh, next month. I think I've got an invite to go as well, so it should be you know <laughs> which will be great. Uh, but but, you, but you're absolutely right, uh, John. That you know the the the, the, the fact that we have have these diverse communities that enrich our society and that we have links back, particularly in, in the, uh, the Caribbean communities, Jamaica, uh, we have lots of those, those communities uh, in Wales. And, you know, that, that particular link with the slave trade as well, in terms of, you know, what we were talking about and what I was talking about specifically in my statement. And, you know, we've, we, we have that link, we have that specific link in Wales, and we, you know, we want to encourage that cultural diversity. We want to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the, the, the links with the, with the slave trade. But more importantly, we want to, we want to encourage our diverse communities to express their culture in Wales. We've always been a welcoming country, a welcoming nation. It, it is our diversity that makes us very special, uh, that the whole of the UK is, is a very diverse nation and a, a, a group of nations. And, and all of that is so important. So I, I, I hope that the, the Reggae Rhythm Festival will be great. I'm, I'm sure it will be, because I will be there. Uh, I'm sure it will be great. I'm sure it will do an awful lot to bring young people together in that community and not so 
for young people if I'm going as well. <laughs> but but it's, uh, it, it's really just to say, John, yes, they, they're a, an excellent organisation and, and a credit to them for the work that they've been, they've been doing in Newport. Diolchir gwenidog ar dyrprwy gwenidog am yr datganiad. Ar eitem nesaf felly yw eitem oeth a hwn yw'r datganiad gan gwenidog y Gymraeg ac addysg ar gyfnogi system addysg wrth hiliaeth. A dwi'n cael yr y gwenidog i wneud i datganiad, Jeremy Miles. Diolch llywydd. Fel llywodraeth, rydyn ni'n hollol glir ei bod yn dysgwyl i honiadau a digwyddiadau o fwlio a hiliaeth gael eu hymchwilio'n llawn ac i gamau gael eu cymryd ar unwaith i fynd i'r afel gyda'r mater i atel achosion pellach rhag digwydd, ar ni wedi ymrwymo'n llwyr i sicrhau bod ein hysgolion yn gynhwysol ac yn groesawgar i bob disgybl. A nes i bwys leisio hyn yn ddiweddar yng nghydestyn achos Rahim Bailey, a'i bod yn bwysig cynnig cymorth i'r teulu ac i gymuned yr ysgol, a fydd hefyd wedi cael ei hyffeithio. Llywydd mae gan ein system addysg rôl a chyfrifoldeb hanfodol i helpu i gyflawni ein gweledigaeth ar gyfer Cymru wrth hiliol. Yn un gwybod bod yr hyn mae pobl ifanc yn ei ddysgu yn yr ysgol yn aros gyda nhw am weddill i hoes ac yn llunio ein cymdeithas i hangach. Mae cynllun gweithredu Cymru wrth hiliol, Llywodraeth Cymru, a gafodd i gyhoeddi heddi yn amlinellu nifer helaeth o nodau a chamau gweithredu i ymgorffori diwylliant gwrth hiliol mewn ysgolion. A hynny er mwyn gwneud newidiadau ystyrlon a mesuradwy i fywydau pobl ddi a siaith ac ethnig leifrifol. Mae'r cynllun hefyd yn dwyn ynghyd gwaith ar draws y maes addysg, sy'n cynnwys diweddaru cynllawiau gwrthfylio statudol fel i fod yn adlywyrchu ein gweledigaeth ar gyfer Cymru wirioneddol uh, wrth hiliol. Er y byddwn ni'n cyflawn i ein hymrwymiad i ddiwyddaru ein cynllawiau gwrthfwlio erbyn ddechrau'r flwyddyn academaidd nesa, byddwn ni'n datblygu i'r cynllawiau hyn ymhellach drwy weithio gyda Chomisiynydd Plant Cymru i ymgys, ymgysylltu a phrofiadau byw, plant a phobl ifanc, yn ogystal yn y thrawon a'n hymarferwyr addysg. Hon gan gydnabod, mae un o'r maesydd y gyfynnu'r fwyaf amdano yw sut y gallwn ni ddarparu gwell cymorth i'r gweithlu addysgu i ddelion briodol gyda chwestiynau mewn perthynas a hil a hiliaeth, mae'r datganiad heddi yn canolbwyntio'n benodol ar y datblygiadau arloesol i sefydlu dull cenedlaethol ar gyfer dysgu proffesiynol ar amrywiaeth ac gwrth hiliaeth. Rhoddwyd sylwyr maes hwn gan yr athro Charlotte Williams OBE a'i gweithgor. Nodwyd ganddynt ei bod yn flenoriaeth i baratoi ymarferwyr ar gyfer y curriculum newydd, ac mae hwnnw yn flynoriaeth allweddol i'r llywodraeth. Caiff y brosiect dysgu proffesiynol ar amrywiaeth a gwrth hiliaeth, DARPL, a'i arwain gan y Rhwydwaith Beimed Cymru a chyngrair o bartneriaid sy'n datblygu'n gyson, gan gynnwys The Black Curriculum a Show Races in the Red Card, ymlith eraill a nhw sy'n sbardino'r prosiect heriol ac ysbrydoledig hwn i gamu ymlaen yn frwdredig. Llywydd Strong Foundations are already in place with regions and partnerships to fully embed this important work to support schools' development of the new curriculum, recognising our shared responsibility to fast-track this agenda. And the DARPL project has already launched a new virtual campus and a series of live events open to all educational professionals, encouraging practitioners to embark on their own anti-racist journey, engaging in difficult conversations and discussing critical issues with peers. The Welsh Government hosted a virtual event with the project's team in March to highlight positive developments, and the project has attracted positive international recognition during this year's World Education Summit. I was delighted to deliver a keynote address at a recent diversity and anti-racism professional learning event to support middle-tier leaders to take action and to help drive change. And following on from that, I am pleased to confirm today that a new professional learning module for middle-tier educational leaders will be developed and that we are extending the reach of the project to include early years and further education so that we see a step change right across the system. And the work of the project is also reaching our early years practitioners via the National Masters in Education. 
This is an important step on a challenging journey over the next 18 months to upskill educational professionals and learners to attain the ambitions of the Welsh Government's Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan and Professor Williams' final report. I will soon be publishing the first annual update on the recommendations by the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Communities, Contributions and Kenevin in the new Curriculum Working Group, reflecting on progress to date. The Curriculum for Wales seeks to engender a sense of Kenevin in both our practitioners and learners, celebrating the diverse culture of modern Wales, ensuring that all practitioners are equipped to meet these expectations in the design of their curriculum and in their pedagogical practice through professional learning will be key to making this a success. We are also working on the development of new materials that will support teachers in their teaching of these important issues. Since publication of Professor Williams' report in March 2021, we've made progress across a number of areas to develop both a whole school and national approach to anti-racism, including becoming the first part of the UK to introduce mandatory teaching of black, Asian and minority ethnic histories in all schools and settings from September 2022, announcing the new Professional Teaching Award, the Betty Campbell MBE Award, for promoting the contributions and perspectives of black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, which will be awarded for the first time this year on the 10th of July, uh, and publishing our plan to increase recruitment of people who are from ethnic minority backgrounds into initial teacher education. This includes, Chloe, for the first time, additional financial incentives targeted at increasing the diversity of our workforce. Sustaining momentum and reviewing progress will be key to ensuring that we are making real change in a sustainable way. We will equip regional consortia and local authority partnerships to address specified priorities and actions within annual plans aligned to recommendations from Professor Williams' report. Regions and partnerships will be critical in supporting the move to a sustainable approach beyond the DARP learning project itself and can develop their own professional learning by engaging with the extended module for senior educational leaders launching early next year. To conclude, Clawith, our young people have a key role to play as positive disruptors and change agents to establish a true culture of inclusion, equipped to make real change moving forward. I've outlined today a number of positive steps which are being taken, but this is just the beginning. There is a great deal of further work needed to build confidence and resilience across the system to tackle racism head on. I will endeavour to keep members updated as we continue to move at pace to deliver an anti-racist education system that Wales can be proud of. Lord Angels. I want to thank the Minister for his statement today. We all want to see a fairer, more inclusive and open Wales. Um, we welcome the new categories that have been added to the Anti-Racist Wales Action Plan. Um, this new holistic approach is the right one. And we welcome the progress that you've outlined today, Minister. Uh, we share your aims in the, today's statement and laid out in the document, but I was hoping to see a bit more meat on the bone uh, today in practice and how they will be delivered. Uh, one of the main aspects I was especially pleased with in the statement and the new action plan was the emphasis on eradicating um, online bullying and racism, which only keeps growing, as we, as we all know. And this obviously affects our young people in and out of school particularly those with uh, mobile phones. I was just wondering how you envisage um, looking to trying to er er eradicate uh, working with the UK government of uh, racism and bullying online. Uh, and when we, will we see a bit more detail on that sort of aspect um, and how you're dealing with it in the education system? Having a diverse set of teachers also across Wales is a crucial part, in my view, of er helping educate children and achieving an anti-racism a racist uh, education system. Black, Asian and ethnic minority role models within our school are very important, particularly, I'd say, in densely populated ethnic minority, black, Asian and ethnic minority areas. It's important to ensure that new and all teachers have a compre comprehensive understanding 
um, of race, diversity and equality issues. So I welcome what you're doing in this regard uh, that you've outlined in your statement. It's so important that teaching staff begin to reflect um, our local communities. Um, Labour have been in power for 23 years, yet we're seeing black and Asian and ethnic minority teachers numbering falling way short of where they should be. Minister, what plans and strategies do you have in place to ensure that we attract and retain more teachers from black, Asian and ethnic minority backgrounds? Um, empowering schools to deal with cases of racism is also fantastic um, and a great way that we'll help combat racism in our education system, but it also needs to be handled with great care and sensitivity. The last thing we want to use is a single case being used to make a political point and that having a detrimental and dangerous impact on the community and school surrounding. Race is emotive and it needs to be handled with care. So, Minister, will there be significant guidance for school leaders and governors to that effect, please? And also, finally, um, Clowerth, uh, do you agree with me, Minister, that it's important that we begin to see more literature in schools that are reflective of our communities, our black, eth Asian and ethnic minority communities, um, that, have been, uh, that also obviously they inform an integral part of where we live? Thank you, Dio. Well, I thank uh, um, Laura Jones for those uh, very important uh, range of uh, questions. I agree with much of the thrust of uh, her, uh, her questioning. I do agree. Uh, that the role of online uh, uh, bullying and racist bullying and racist um, harassment is you know, a, a very important part of this picture and the resources which we are working on will, uh, will support both learners and uh, teachers and teaching assistants in, in able, being able to engage with that and we will continue our work in engaging with the UK government to make sure that both governments are doing absolutely everything that they can uh, to address that really important issue. Um, uh, she made a very important set of uh, points about the diversity of our education workforce in Wales. Our education workforce is not as diverse as the learners in the classrooms which they teach. And that is true actually in all parts uh, of Wales, both rural and, uh, rural and urban. Um, and so I want to see that picture improved in all parts of Wales. I, I know that she wasn't suggesting that shouldn't be the case, but I do think it's important to set that expectation in all parts of the geography uh, of Wales. Um, this is the first academic year from 2023 onwards where we will have introduced a specific financial incentive to encourage stu uh, students from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities to take up initial teacher education. And we will do more, as you will have seen from the plan, to work with ITE partnerships to increase the visibility and presence within their curricula uh, of the anti-racist approaches that we want to see for all uh, our teaching workforce. But in addition to encouraging uh, students into the profession, it's really important to support uh, teachers and teaching professionals from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities who are already in the system. And an important part of that is progression so that we can see school leaders that young professionals can look up to uh, as an inspiration for their own career paths. And we are a very long way uh, from being able to say that that is the reality. And the discussions that I've had with uh, Baymed, Network, Baymed Network and others has really focused on that as being uh, an important part of our uh, plans into the future. And there's a role there for governors as well in understanding uh, progression, recruitment of the senior leadership teams and so on. So at each level, if you like, of the schools, uh, of a professional journey or the school's governance, there is uh, work to be done and she will have seen in the plan that we've embarked upon that, um, focusing on ITE, but that there is, that there is um, certainly much more that we plan to do as is, uh, as is set out. I do agree with what uh, Laura Ann Jones said, that um, we need to be able to ensure that all teachers, whether they have the lived experience of uh, you know, racist incidents or not in their own lives are able to handle confidently and sensitively issues which arise in school and which affect the life of the school. Um, and so the DARPA project is very much based on upskilling, if you like, professionals generally to be able to deal with issues of harassment and bullying, for them to be reported, for the data to be captured and for responses to be, uh, to be given which are uh, appropriate and very clearly in accordance with our commitment to an anti-racist education system. And as she was saying, the role of leaders in that is also very important. Um, she will have uh, noted that the, uh, the additional funding to the National Academy for School Leadership 
uh, education leadership, which is intended to encourage um, them to look at the diverse workforce and the role specifically of leaders in supporting their, in supporting their schools uh, to be able to play their part in creating an anti-racist world. So that's very much part of the uh, plans that we are setting out uh, today. Um, and finally, um, uh, she made a very important point uh, about the resources available uh, for teachers to be able to uh, teach the new curriculum, but also to adopt the anti-racist approaches which the plan sets out today. We're working with external suppliers on the development of new materials that will support teachers uh, to teach black, Asian and minority histories and experiences as part of the new uh, curriculum. Um, the supplier is now in its uh, in a research phase, if you like, and is engaging with uh, external organisations, obviously with professional uh, professionals, with teachers and others as well, um, as we develop that. And I'll have more to say about that in due course. But that work is underway. Hello, Vachan. Ac yn amlwg, mae'n bwysig ofnadwy bod ni'n cael datganiad penodol hwn o ran addysg oherwydd gweld ni wedi clywed eisoes mae'r ôl o ddysgu a chodi am y byddiaeth o oed ifanc mor, mor bwysig. Os ydyn ni go iawn eisiau creu cenedl lle, lle bod hiliaeth ddim yn bodoli. Dyn ni'n gwybod um, o siarad gyda cnifer o bobl, dyn ni'n cynrychioli bod profiadau yn yr ysgol wedi bod yn ysgytwol i gymaint y bobl. Mi fi oedd nifer ohono ni sydd yma heddiw um, mewn sesiwn gyda Privilege Cafe, chydig fisoedd yn ôl, lle mi oedd na nifer yn sôn wrthyn ni yn lun eu profiadau erchyll nhw yn yr ysgol o ran hiliaeth, a hefyd y ffaith bod o ddim yn brofiad positif iddyn nhw, bod nhw ddim eisiau parhau yn yr ysgol, neu mynd mlaen i brif ysgol oherwydd bod y byd yn yr ysgol ddim, ddim yn rhywbeth lle oedd yn nhw'n teimlo bod nhw'n gallu thynnu na bod yn nhw eu hunain na teimlo'n ddiogel. Felly mae yna waith mawr i wneud yn y maes hwn. A dwi'n crysawu'n benodol eich bod chi wedi rhoi neges mor glir yn y senedd hon. Bod na waith dirfar i'w wneud, ond hefyd eich ymrwymiad chi, dwi'n meddwl ydych chi ddefnyddio'r dgeiriau uh, fast track and at pace, bod ni angen bod yn gyflym am hyn, oherwydd yn amlwg efo bob blwyddyn mae hyn yn mynd heibio, mae profiadau yma yn effeithio ar blant a phobl ifanc am weddill eu bywydau. Oherwydd, ni welson ni'n radroddiad gyhoeddwyd yn nwy fil ag ugen gan dannos y cerdyn coch i hiliaeth, mae hiliaeth yn gyffredin yn system ysgolion Cymru, ac mae'n debygol bod athrawon o staff cymorth dysgu yn tam am cangyfrif y sefyllfa yn fawr. Yn wir camfyr adroddiad hwnnw bod 63 y cant o ddisgyblion i wneud wedi dioddau neu yn adnabod rhywun sydd wedi dioddau hiliaeth yn yr ysgol. Mae'r hyn i am ffigyrau syfrdanol. A oedden ni'n gweld yr adroddiad hwnnw yn unig dim ond oherwydd lliw croi nag ati, ond oherwydd crefydd yn benodol, bod na gymaint o ystyriaethau fan hyn a pam, mor hyn, pam bod hyn mor bwysig, bod ni'n dod i ddeall yn gilydd yn well, bod ni'n dod i ddeall be ydy Cymru fod yr am, amal ddiwylliannol. A gwrthdroi'r stereoteip yma bod na berson penodol sydd yn Gymro neu'n Gymraes, mae hyn am rwt llwyr. Mi ydyn ni gyd yn Cymru, os ydyn ni'n byw yng Nghymru, a dwi'n meddwl bod rhaid i ni weithio'n galed i gagwared o'r myth hwnnw. Yn bellach uh, yn yr adroddiad hwnnw, mae canran yr addysgwyr sy'n dysgu gwrthiliaeth wedi cwympo ers astudiaeth 2016, a mi oedden nhw'n deud bod diffyg amser a diffyg hyder yn cael eu nodi fel y prif heriau. A dwi'n meddwl bod hynny'n wych bod chi yn cydnabod hynny o fewn y cynllun hwn ac yn ceisio mynd i'r afael. Ond nid yw mwyafrif yr athrawon hyd yma wedi derbyn unrhyw hyfforddiant gwrthiliaeth, a dyn ni'n gwybod o, o drafodaethau eraill yn ei wedi cael o'r pwysau aruthrol ar athrawon ar y funud o ran y cwriclwm newydd, yn hynny o'n dysgu ychwanegol ag ati bod nhw'n deud am y diffyg amser. Mae'r rhaid i ni sicrhau bod hwn yn ganolog i hynny a'r cwestiwn bod ni'n hoffi gofyn ydy yn amlwg dych chi wedi rhoi'r ymrwymiad i sefydlu dull cenedlaethol ar gyfer dysgu proffesiynol ar amrywiaeth a gwrthiliaeth, ond sut fyddwn ni'n sicrhau bod athrawon gyda'r amser i wneud hyn fel bod nhw yn i gyd yn teimlo bod nhw wedi um, cael rhyfforddiant sydd ddirfawr i angen. Mae nod y cynllun o sicrhau bod straeon, cyfraniadau a hanesion pobl ddi, asiaeth ac ethnig yn leofrifol yn cael eu hyddysgu trwy'r cyriclwm i gymryd diwygiedig, felly o'r pwys mwyaf. 
ac er gwaetha nod y llywodraeth o roi'r cricwlwm newydd ar waith y medi 2022, dan ni'n gwybod bod rhai ysgolion wedi dweud y bydd angen iddynt o hirio'r gweithredu am flwyddyn arall. Felly wynidog pa fe serau lluniaru bydd yn cael eu rhoi ar waith ar gyfer y gweithredu anwastad ac ar oedi hwn a'i ganlyniadau ar gyfer amserlennu'r cynllun um, fel dyn ni wedi weld yn y cynllun heddiw. Um, Mi nath Loran Jones sôn am hyn, ond sy'n un hoffi gofyn yn bellach o ran yr er, er nod o gynyddu recrutio thrawon o gymunedau lleafrifoedd ethnig i'r sector addysg, gyda'r sector ffocws clir a recrutio i raglenni addysg gychwynol a thrawon hefyd yn hanfodol i'r perwyl hwn. Uh, allwch chi eich gleiro, pam na ellir eich hangi'r ystod o bynciau sydd ar gael ar gyfer y cynllun sail cyflogaeth addysg gychwynol a thrawon i ddenu staff cymorth o gymdiroedd llefrifoedd ethnig gan gyfr, gynnwys cyfrwng Cymraeg. Tan fis medi 2025, uh, chaiff eich gynnig drwy raglenni prifysgol gorau, dim ond lle bod hynny'n ymarferol ac yn economaidd ac yn addysgol yn ôl y cynllun. Fedrwch chi eich gleiro hyn am bellach os gwelwch yn dda. Yn amlwg mi fyddwn ni yn croesawu yn fawr nifer o'r gweithredu hyn, ond mi fydd rhaid i ni gadw golwg barcid o ran sut mae hyn yn cael ei gweithredu sy'n cryhau bod yr hyfforddiant yn ei le fel dyn ni wedi sôn mae plant a phobl ifanc yn wynebu hiliaeth yn un ysgolion ni ar y funud. Dydy hyn ddim yn dderbyniol am ar rhaid newid hyn fel bod pawb yn ddiogel yn yr ysgol. Beth yma hi wedi gofyn amdani nhw yn ei, uh, yn ei chwestiwn. Um, Na, jyst uh, nath i ddegychwyn ar um, drwy sôn yn brofiadau dysgwyr um, sy'n cael brofiadau um, hiliol yn yr ysgol a bydd amryw yn cael profiad uniongarchol o hynny um, mewn ysgolion a dyna, dyna nod sydd gyda ni nid yn unig sicrhau nad yw, uh, nad yw hynny'n digwydd mewn ffordd sydd yn uniongarchol ac na bod hynny'n digwydd na bod um, na bod uh, um, uh, enghreifftiau o'n digwydd yn ysgolion o'n bod diwylliant gwrthiliol yn eu hangach na hynny yn ysgolion ni, fe bod e'n rhan greiddiol o fywyd yr ysgol. Nid yn ei bod i ddim yn gweld uh, achlysuron yn digwydd, o'n bod, bod e'n rhan o'n gwylliant eu hangach yr ysgol, bod hyn yn rhywbeth wrthyn i'n gwerthoedd ni fel cenedl ac fel, ys, ac fel uh, system, uh, system addysg. Na thi bwynt pwysig iawn yn lun a dilynu yn daddysg iadol, a bod profiad ysgol falle yn dod i bobl off mynd yn mellach i addysg uh, bellach ac addysg uwch. Felly, o'i sicr bydd hi'n croesawu ar hyn o'r gyda ni ddweud ran gwaith ôl un deg chwech o ddeall profiadau unigolion o'i profiad ysgol nhw, a bod ni'n gallu, um, gallu diwygio polisiau ac a, a, a fframweithiau i adlu ar chi beth yn ni'n dysgu o, ba, o, brofiad, uh, o brofiad byw uh, dysgwyr. A o ran hyfforddiant cyffredinol, ond dyna oedd bwrdwn y, y, y datganiad heddi, wrth gwrs. Um, Mae'r pwynt mae ma hi'n wneud yn bwysig o ran uh, sicrhau bod uh, hyfforddiant proffesiynol yn ganolog i brofiad uh, uh, ymarferwyr i uh, athrawon. Yr hyn yn ei eisiau gweld yw bod er enghraifft y er gwaith mae'r prosiect darpl yn ei wneud uh, yn cael ei um, bod e'n bod e rhan anadod o baratoi gyfer y cwr, cwriculwm i hynna. Oherwydd y ffordd yn ein dysgu'r cwriculwm bod cwestiynau gyda phrofiadau diasiad a llaifrifoedd llai ethnig yn cael ei brif rydio, soffwch chi, trwy'r cwriculwm. Mae'n bwysig bod y ffordd o, o, o hyfforddi proffesiynol hefyd yn rhan o hynny, a bod y thrawon ddim yn gweld hynny fel rhywbeth sydd ar, ar, ar wahân, soffwch chi. A dyna fydd, dyna fydd angen wneud yn, yn yr hyta mor hi, yw sicrhau bod y pethau'n digwydd ar y cyd yn hytrach na bod, fel, fel bod, fel bod uh, y ffordiant yn gynaladwy uh, yn yr hyd dymor fel rhan o'r cwriculwm uh, newydd. Um, Mae'r ailwyr yn gwybod, mae oedd gan, gan ysgolion uwch rai ddewis o gychwyn eleni neu flwyddyn nesaf. O fe mae'n digwyr, oedd o'n i'n hapus iawn gyda rhifoedd oedd wedi dewis mynd eleni o ystyried falle bod ysgolion uwch rai a fwy chyfer o bellter yr siwrnau fyn ac ysgolion cynradd. Felly, um, ond bydd hyn yn rhywbeth sydd yn esblygu o flwyddyn i flwyddyn. Bydd pob disgybl yn ysgolion cynradd ni o fis medi mlaen yn gallu manteisio ar y cwricwlwm pellach, a pan byddwn nhw'n cyrraedd ysgolion ysgol uwch rai flwyddyn nesa, bydd y llwybr hynny'n parhau, bydd y siwrnau hynny'n parhau. Felly, byddai profiad nhw o'r ffordd newydd yn oddysgu um, am, am approaches wrth hiliol yn rhan o'i profiad cychwynnol nhw nawr. Felly, mae hynny'n mae dilyniant hwn nhw'n bwysig iawn hefyd. O ran hyfforddi ac o ran uh, recrutio, jyst i neu ddim ail ddweud, beth wnes i ddweud wrth uh, Laura Ann Jones, yr elfen sydd yn cael ei 
ddisgrifio yn y cynllun fel un sydd ddim wedi gymryd ychydig yn hwy i ni allu edrych arno fe. Yw'r elfen honno sydd yn gymwys i bobl sydd yn hyfforddi trai bod yn mewn gwaith yn edrych na'r cynllun hyfforddi addysg gyffredinol. Felly mae'n bosi byr i'w un sydd yn mewn nhw i, I, I ddysgu o gefndi'r diasiad a llefrio ethnig lenni i fanteisio ar yn incentive ar gyfer hwnnw a hefyd ar incentive ar gyfer dysgu pwnc sydd, um, sydd yn brin a hefyd dysgu drwy'r gyfer Gymraeg. Felly mae amryw o gymhelliol ar gael yn mwyn sicrhau bod uh, yr amrywiaeth yn hob ran o'r gweithio addysg. Jenny Rathbon. Thank you very much. Uh, very much look forward to the award of the Betty Campbell uh, Award on, in July um, and uh, very much welcome the um, report, uh, the, the statement you've made today. I'm very glad that you have announced that you're going to ha extend the um, anti-racism activity to early years and um, further education because obviously when children start in early years they, d they don't bring any um, racist baggage with them, it's learned from adults or older siblings. So, you know, this is a great place to start because uh, they're, they're completely um, uh, blind to uh, the, the different colours of people's skins. Um, so that's absolutely fantastic and that's what we need to build on and ensure that everybody feels that way. Um, so, uh, you know, and in the context of the level of institutionalised racism that exists throughout most institutions and the resistance of, um, you know, the Home Office to even admit what's in the report um, that, they, that has been leaked um, about institutionalised racism in our immigration policies over the last 70 years and the failure of the police to admit that they've got institutionalised racism in the police force, we clearly have a major problem unless we recognize the problem we've got. So um, I think it's really complicated, a bit like other aspects of the new curriculum, the, the relationship, sexuality, um, education is, is complicated, and, but it's very exciting that we've got the new curriculum to enable us to, um, to deal with these matters. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, there's um, a teacher called Jeffrey Bwaki, who's about to publish a new book um, called I Heard What You Said, and he's both a secondary school teacher, author and broadcaster, and he argues that racism is a safeguarding issue and that's something that we should, you know, take that seriously. Um, and I just wondered whether you uh, felt that was the case. Uh, clearly, he had the experience of being the only black teacher <laughs> in, in this village or the school. Um, um, and clearly, this is a more complex problem in an area where there is less diversity. I've, I'm privileged to uh, represent a community of uh, where 35% of uh, people in Cardiff in schools are from an ethnic <coughs> minority, and how wonderful is that? But it's much more difficult, it would seem to me, in areas where there are less, uh, there's less diversity. So I wondered if you would be considering having a greater focus on ensuring that people who are in a real minority in parts of our community are really being safeguarded to ensure that school continues to be a positive experience rather than one that traumatizes them. Um, thank you, Jenny Rathbo, for that uh, question. And I think it's important to say that the ambitions that we have in our plan are ambitions which relate to every school in Wales. Now, every school in Wales will live in a different community, and the, uh, the demographic and ethnic makeup of that community will differ in different parts of Wales. But we want every child in Wales to be able to benefit from being part of an education system which is anti-racist positively. And we want teachers in every school in Wales to feel confident uh, and supported uh, to be able to identify and deal uh, uh, with issues of uh, bullying or harassment in school, but also, uh, much more positively, to be able to teach the full curriculum reflecting the experiences of all parts of our communities, including black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. So I, I do accept that it's a different set of challenges in different parts of Wales, but I think the objective needs to be uh, a common objective so that everyone, whichever part of Wales you're in school, uh, have the benefit of the full, uh, have the full uh, curriculum. And I think it will be important to make sure that as part of the professional learning which I've been talking about today, that we um, enable teachers safely 
to, look, to make sure that you know, all, all, uh, all uh, school environments are safe in this sense, and that the teaching and the professional learning available to them is sensitive to the context in which they're practicing. And that would be different in different parts of Wales as well. But I think I just want to restate that principle. It's really important that we have this as a common objective in all schools, in all communities, in all parts of Wales. Diolchir Gweinidog, reit ymnesaf felly o'r ddadl ar adolygiad blynyddol y Comisiwn Cydraddol Deba Hawliad Dynol a dwi'n galw ar y Gweinidog Cyfiawnder i wneud y cynnig yma sef Jane Hutt. Diolch Dawydd and I, I welcome this debate on the Equality and Human Rights Commission's Wales Impact Report for 2020-21. The Welsh Government has benefited for many years from a positive and productive working relationship with EHRC's team in Wales. And this has continued through the period covered by this report, and it's reflected across many of the issues it highlights. I'd like to thank Martin Jones for his leadership as Interim Chair of the Wales Committee during the period covered by the Impact Report, and extend a warm welcome to Errol Bessie on her recent appointment as EHRC Wales Commissioner. We fully share the core aim identified in the Impact Report to ensure that, and I quote, strong equality and human rights laws protect people and data shows what is happening to people in practice. During the pandemic and since, we have been taking action in many areas that just demonstrates our commitment in that respect. In partnership with EHRC's Wales team, we've progressed the review of the public sector equality duty Welsh regulations. This work was paused because of COVID, but is now being taken forward as part of our response to the Strengthening and Advancing Equality and Human Rights Research Report. The socio-economic duty came into force in Wales on the 31st of March 2021, requiring relevant public bodies to place consideration of inequalities of outcomes arising from socio-economic disadvantage at the heart of their decisions. The duty has been welcomed and there are already examples of public bodies integrating the duty into planning and reporting frameworks. We work closely with the Equality and Human Rights Commission and partners to take this forward, recognising the recommendation of the Commission in its Is Wells Fairer 2018 report. And as I've said, it's already informing policy development in our public services. The Welsh Government is going further. It's recognised that fair work is critical to achieving a stronger, modernised, more inclusive economy. It can assist in addressing inequality, reducing poverty and promoting well-being. And work is continuing um, as we introduce the Social Partnership and Public Procurement Bill, Wales Bill, with the statement made by the Deputy Minister for Social Partnership today, introducing new social partnership and socially responsible public procurement duties. Our Advancing Gender Equality in Wales Plan provides the framework through which we will address the changing landscape for women in Wales and our programme for government prioritises implementation of key aspects of this plan. The pandemic has revealed society's dependence on work that is disproportionately done by women as unpaid carers and as employees within care, social work and hospitality. The pandemic has also highlighted the brilliance of women's contribution to the scientific and clinical response. As we move out of this crisis and into another on cost of living, it's crucial we place far stronger work value on this work which is central to our economy and our communities. To support this, a gender equality subgroup has been convened, which brings together stakeholders working on gender equality issues across Wales. And two priorities identified by the group are women's health and how unpaid care disproportionately falls to women. Our programme for government commits to strengthening and expanding the Violence Against Women, Domestic Abuse and Sexual <laughs> Violence Strategy to include a focus on violence against women in the street and workplace, as well as the home, in order to make Wales the safest place in Europe to be a woman. And you will know, of course, that the 2022-26 Valder SV National Strategy was published on the 24th of May. To ensure that all our work on equality is underpinned by evidence, which is a key call from uh, the Impact Report, we have established an Equality Evidence Unit a race disparity unit, evidence unit, and a disability dispar disparity evidence unit. And they have a shared mission to improve the availability, quality, and accessibility of evidence about individuals with protected and associated characteristics so that we fully understand the level and types of inequalities across Wales. 
and this will enable decision makers to develop better informed policies and to assess and measure their impact alongside, of course, the implementation of the public helping to form public sector equality duties and the socio-economic duty. The EHRC impact report recognises the influence they exerted on the consultation leading to the new Wales transport strategy, Loba Noith, launched for public consultation on the 17th of November, explaining how we plan to open our transport system to a different world. The strategy sets out a long-term vision for an accessible and sustainable transport system, aiming to ensure that equality is integrated into transport planning at the highest level, rather than seen as a separate issue. Well, colleagues, we have just announced um, a lot, um, this afternoon an anti-racist Wales, an action plan for Wales. And it also the EHRC has played an important role um, in addressing these issues. The plan, of course, is, as we discussed this afternoon, calls for zero tolerance of racism in all its forms. And identifying vision and values for an anti-racist Wales containing goals, actions, timelines and tangible outcomes which will move us from the rhetoric on racial equality and ensure we deliver meaningful action. But we're also fully committed as the Welsh Government to supporting all disabled people in Wales and locked out liberating disabled people's lives and rights in Wales beyond COVID-19 was published in July 2021, highlighting the inequalities that many disabled people face in Wales and in response, the Disability Rights Task Force has been established, bringing together people with lived experience. Welsh Government policy leads and representative organisations identi have identified the issues and barriers that affect the lives of many disabled people. Our new curriculum for Wales will play a crucial role in relation to equality, essential as it reflects the true diversity of our population, that learners understand how this diversity has shaped modern Wales. And we discussed this again this, this afternoon with a statement by the Minister for education and Welsh language. But it's also important that um, the curriculum as well in, uh, provides important opportunities around relationships and sexuality education. So finally, Chloe, the Welsh Government's response to our research into strengthening and advancing equality in human rights has now been published. And I, I welcome the Human Rights Tracker um, the, 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 the first in, the, in one of the first in the, in the world that's been produced by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. I mean, we, in our research, um, set out the main areas that we've worked, we want to take forward, including exploring options for incorporation of UN conventions into Welsh law, such as the Welsh Human Rights Bill, in line with our programme for government. But also, uh, it's, we are pu pu publishing a large body of evidence as part of our preparations for this year's UN review of how the UK as a whole is fulfilling its international human rights obligations, the Universal Periodic Review. And this will be the first time we've taken this step, as well as contributing to the UK State Report prepared by the UK Government. Doing so is a further demonstration of our commitment to raising the profile of equality and human rights in Wales. The EHR's impact report, report provides us with an important overview of the Commission's work in Wales and clearly demonstrates the need for continued vigilance and practical action to safeguard equality and human rights in support of us all, particularly those who are at risk of being marginalised, victimised or suffering discrimination. I commend the motion. Alta Thank you very much, Welcome to the publication of 2020-21 Wales Impact Report and the breadth of the work that the Commission is engaged in. They have clearly developed a significant strategic uh, role in Wales, engaging in much of the work of government, the Senate and other key partners. That is clearly evidenced in their report. They have provided advice to organizations and supported the efforts during the depth of the pandemic, including challenging the Welsh Government by scrutinizing the inappropriate blanket approach to health care decisions on issues such as do not attempt to resuscitation notice, rules around care home visits, testing for care home residents and staff, and discharging older people with COVID-19 from hospitals into care homes. 
I welcome the robust approach to these key issues, working closely with the Older People's Commissioner for Wales in highlighting such important concerns. In the COVID inquiry, now being advanced by the UK government, I hope that these critical observations will be included as evidence of the impact, not of COVID itself, but of the decisions of Welsh ministers on the human rights of older people in Wales. Before turning to specific points in the report, I would like to say that as we are already approaching the midpoint of 2022, it is somewhat frustrating that we are considering the report, which is already more than 12 months out of date, compared to many other public bodies who will have already published their 2021-22 report. To make this exercise more valuable, this needs to be addressed for future reports. Having said that, I welcome the opportunity to consider the range of work they are engaged in. I said that their strategic impact as a key partner is evidenced. That much is clear. What is not what is a little unclear is how much, how the Commission can educate the measure, the impact of their work in Wales, and whether, as a UK public body, they have done this effectively. The introduction of the Wales Impact Report says that, I quote, our unique legal powers allow us to tangibly change lives in these challenging times, we are using these powers more robustly and more intelligently than ever before. I unquote. I agree with this statement. As an organization created through statute, they have been given significant powers by the Parliament to address inequalities and prompt improvement and promote improvement. However, beyond the broad narrative in the report, which sets out a lot of actions and engagements, it is hard to evidence how their legal powers have tangibly changed lives and where the people of Wales can see such an impact in the robust fashion that the report suggests. The aims are substantial. I believe monitoring human rights now is as important as ever, and raising awareness of the Equality Act 2010 that bans discrimination is widely in wider society. During the pandemic, during the pandemic, there were do not resuscitate policies in place for people with learning difficulties or the treatment of older people. This blanket policy is discriminatory and a breach of human rights. We must work harder to create a fairer and safer Wales for all. Thank you very much. Rhwng creu sawi'r cyfle i gyfrannu i'r fadl hon heddiw, mae'r Comisiwn Cydraddoldeb a hawliau dynol yn parhau i wneud gwaith holl bwysig, ac yn wir yn ystod y cyfnod pryderus hwn pan fo hawliau dynol dan fy gythiad di gynsail o di llywodraeth Doriaeth San Stefan, yn gwneud gwaith cwbl allweddol i sicrhau bod sefydliadau a Llywodraeth Cymru yn gweithredu ar bob cyfle i sicrhau tegwch i bobl Cymru, felly rwy'n falch o gydnabod y gwaith hwnnw yma yn y siambr. Er mwyn paratoi ar gyfer fy nghyfraniad heddi, edrych ys yn ôl ar adroddiadau blaenorol y Comisiwn Cydraddoldeb a Hawliau Dynol, ar sylwadau a chwestiynau perthnasol a godwyd yn ei sgil, a bob blwyddyn mae'n ymddangos sy'n bod yn teimlo bod, bod y bygythiad i hawliau dynol yn ddigynsail. Dros y blynyddoedd dweddar, o, dweddar wrth y mateb i'r adroddiadau, rwy'n i wedi cyfeirio at bolisiau llymder yn bygwth cyflogaeth y bywoliaeth a goblygiadau ni wedi ol Brexit a oedd yn rhoi sylfaen hawliau dynol mewn perygl, a wedyn dros y blynyddoedd mae yna ddatblygiad amlwg hefyd wedi bod yn yr ymwybyddiaeth o effeithiau newid hinsawdd ar hawliau dynol. A gwelsom yr enghraifft hawliau sylfaenol i gartre diogel yn cael ei olchi ffwrdd yn llythrennol wrth i rai o'n cymunedau ddioddau llifogydd mwy cyson a mwy difrifol. Ac wrth i ni gael ein taro gan bandemig byd eang, wrth gwrs bi bob un ohonom ni ar chwilio natur 
ein hawl i gofal iechyd ac iechyd i gael cyswllt gyda'n gilydd a'n hawliau fel gweithwyr. Ac am lygwyd sut y cafodd hawliau rhai grwpiau penodol fel y cyfeiriodd Altaf Hussein uh, o'n cymdeithas uh, er enghraifft pobl uh, anabal a phlant, pobl mewn cartrefi gofal. Y rhai oedd yn derbyn gofal mamolaeth eu tramgwyddo a'u hesgeluso yn ddifrifol ar brydiau gan rhai o bendyfniadau'r llywodraeth yn ystod y cyfnod hwnnw. A nawr rhy'n i'n wynebu ar gyfwng costau byw cwbl, enbyd a thrychinebus wrth gwrs ar gyfwng economaidd a chymdeithasol sy'n deillio o ac yn cael ei ddyfynhau yn raddol gan effaith gyfansawdd nifer o'r elfennau hyn yn y gystal a rhai elfennau newydd fel pris yni a rhyfel ar ein cyfandir gan fygwth rhai o hawliau dynol mwyaf sylfaenol ein pobl i fwyd a gwres. Yr hyn naeth ffynharo oedd er gweitha y rhagdybiaeth gyffredinol bod hawliau dynol yn, har- yn arhosol ac wedi hymreiddio yn gadarn i weiad ein cymdeithas, mae'n amlwg bod angen i ni weithio'n galetach i'w di- diogelu o flwyddyn i flwyddyn ac mae'r pwysau ar y Comisiwn Cydraddoldeb y Hawliau Dynol felly yn dwysau a'u gwaith yn cynyddu. I droi at y droddiad diweddara y Comisiwn yng Nghymru rwy'n cymerydwyo ei gwaith a'u ffocws benodol ar addysg a phobl ifanc, y defnydd o ataliaeth mewn ysgolion sy'n dal i fod yn gymaint o bryder i gymaint o rieni ac yng nghenio'n dysgu ychwanegol. Yr angen i drefnydiaeth fod yn fwy cynhwysol a chymwys ar gyfer pobl yn abl a phobl hun, gwaith teg fel y clywson i gan y wynidog a mynediad at gyfiawnder. Mae cam wahaniaethu ac ynghydraddoldeb yn y meysydd rhyw wedi rhestru y byr comisiwn yn ymchwilio iddynt yn codi'n aml yn fy ngwaith waith achos fel nifer o elodau eraill dwi'n siŵr. Felly mae gwaith y comisiwn i daflu goleini ar y materion yma er mwyn sicrhau datrysiadau polisi yn hynod werthfawr. Mae gwaith monitro a chasglu data y comisiwn yn agwedd hanfodol ar graffi ar Lywodraeth Cymru a'i dwyni gyfri. Ac fel aelod o'r pwyllgor cydraddoldebau a chyfiawnder cymdeithasol, mae diffyg data priodol wedi codi dro ar ôl tro yn ein hymchwiliadau ac felly rwy'n croesawu'r ffraith bod y Llywodraeth wedi gweld yr angen o'r diwedd am uned data cydraddoldebau penodol i fynd i'r afel ar bylchau yn y data i gynorthwyo yn y gwaith o monitro a chreu polisiau mwy effeithiol. Ac hoffwn glywed felly gan y Llywodraeth beth yw'r cynydd o ran yr uned yma fyddai'n ddiau yn cynorthwyo y cymysiwn yn ei hymchwiliadau. Ewyn llwyr weithredol i ni clywed bod e wedi cael ei sefydlu. Ewyn llwyr weithredol eto. Ac a fydd y wybodaeth hanfodol yma ar gael i sefydliadau ymchwil arbenigol. Nid yn unig y mae'r cyfrifol deibau'r Comisiwn Cydraddoldeb a Hawliau Dynol yn cynyddu, ond maent hefyd yn wynebu Llywodraeth yn San Stefan sy'n elyn ieithus i'w gwaith, sy'n anelu at danseilio ac yn wir disodlu Hawliau Dynol a'r ffrangweithiau sy'n sylfaen iddynt. Rwy wedi sôn mewn dadl ddiweddar ar ddiwygio'r ddeddf Hawliau Dynol bod yma angen dybryd a chlir i geisio datganoli cyfrifol debau cydraddoldeb a Hawliau Dynol i Gymru o'r diwedd. Mae'n amlwg bod consensus ei yng ngachadarn yng nghylch dilliau o ddiogelu cydraddoldeb a Hawliau Dynol nad yw'n ymddangos yn bosibl i gyflawni uh, yn dan awdurdod San Stefan. Yn hytrach mae hawliau dynol yn cael eu herio uh, gan lywodraeth sydd am ddatgymalu'r ddedd hawliau dynol uh, gan eu bod yn credu bod bydd y cyhoedd wedi byrygli drwy eu hangi hawliau y gwrthwyneb wrth gwrs sy'n wir ac mae adroddiad y comisiwn a'u gwaith hanfodol wrth warchod cydraddoldeb yng Nghymru yn amlyn nellu hynny yn gwbl eglur. Mae'n anochel y byddai peidio a gweithredu ar fyrder i greu mesur hawliau Cymreig yn golygu caniatau, dileu amddiffyniadau am rhai mwyaf bregus a di amddiffyn yn ein cymdeithas. Felly hoffwn o bod beth yw'r cynnydd o ran hynny. Mae'r amser i archwilio drosodd, mae'n amser i weithredu ac mae'r plai Cymru yn cytuno gyda hynny. Diolch. Y gwyn ni dod i ymateb i'r ddadl. Jane Hutt. Diolch yn fawr, Llywydd. And diolch yn fawr for all the contributions and thank uh, members um, for participating today. I think the debate has clearly demonstrated uh, the importance of safeguarding equality and human rights in Wales across a wide range of issues. Um, and it is, come, comes after three statements 
um, ad addressing our, our commitment to uh, the implementing the anti-racist action plan and also indeed the introduction of the uh, social partnership and public procurement bill which are all re relevant to equality and human rights. So uh, I think highlighting the role of the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission in these debates um, is very important and clearly COVID means that we're catching up with some of the uh, reports of the accountability is crucial and uh, not just in terms of our response to the reports as the Welsh Government uh, but also to scrutinise the work of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. So I've indicated already uh, areas of policy that where we've worked together effectively and with impact because obviously we are dealing with both devolved and non-devolved areas um, in terms of those policy issues. So the impact report has been important to us and I say that we have a very strong and positive relationship with the EHRC uh, and we do remain grateful for the guidance when developing policy and legislation. I work very closely uh, I meet regularly with Ruth Coombs, the head of EHRC in Wales, and I want to thank their team again for all of the work, but also officials working on a variety of work, and I've mentioned the work in terms of strengthening public sector equality duty in Wales and the impl uh, introduction and implementation of the socio-economic duty. And we do have to ensure that EHRC retains a strong and distinct presen presence in Wales, because this is an unprecedented time for equality and human rights in the UK. Um, the work of the EHRC is more important than ever. And I do want to just comment on a couple of points raised um, by both Atal Hussein and, and Sean Williams, uh, particularly relating to older people. I was very pleased to be able to uh, meet the cross-party group on older people chaired by uh, Mike Hedges today, where I was... Um, able to talk a bit about how we had responded to their views about the fact that we need to have a specific work stream um, on older people in the next, the new strategy, the, uh, the next stage of the violence against women, domestic abuse and sexual violence strategy. We'd learnt that from working together um, through the influence of the cross-party group and its members, uh, but also working with the Older People's Commissioner and Age Cymru to monitor um, particularly, for example, the impact of the pandemic on older people. Um, but also the Older People's Commission meets regularly uh, and, and with the Deputy Minister for Health and Social Services. And recent conversations have focused on the rights of older people in care homes. And, and just le uh, learning lessons to ensure that we have a rights-based approach with the strategy for ageing society. And, I mean, I think there are areas where we have huge concerns, where we would like the EHR, EHRC to address. For example, I would say the exclusion of migrant women from protection against abuse. I would expect the Equality and Human Rights Commission to agree with me that it's not sufficient for the UK government to adopt the protocols of the UN Convention against all forms of discrimination against women, CEDAW, that um, has been raised in this chamber more uh, than once if some of the most vulnerable women in our communities are deliberately excluded from the safeguards it provides. And I think, you know, it's just to bring us back finally to our international commitments and reputation in relation to equality and human rights. Sean Ed Williams, you identify those areas which have had a huge impact in terms of everyone with protected characteristics and equality and human rights, the impact of climate change and austerity. Um, we're currently waiting for the UK government to publish details of the Bill of Rights, which it proposes to replace the Human Rights Act 1998. Unless they're radically difficult, different to those set out in the recent consultation, which unfortunately we don't expect, this will be a step backwards that will send all of the wrong signals to regressive and repressive regimes around the world. In this context, finally, uh, Chloe, the Welsh Government will do all it can to stand up for and safeguard the most fundamental principles of equality and human rights for everyone in Wales. It is vital. The Equality and Human Rights Commission has, a strong, has to have a strong and independent presence in Wales. We look forward to meeting the new Commissioner. Uh, they need to continue to provide us with unbiased evidence. We have our new Equality Evidence Unit. It, it, it is in place. The appointments have been made. I'm very glad to be able to reassure 
uh, uh, Sean, of that of that point. Um, and its mission is to improve availability, quality, granularity and accessibility of, of evidence by individuals with protected and associated characteristics. And it's going to support the whole of the Welsh Government with better informed policies. Um, and we, we have developed a draft strategic evidence plan describing scope, remit and priorities. And we'll publish that in this summer. So I'm, I'm glad that we have... I've been able to clarify that this afternoon. Yes, uh, EHRC must have a strong and independent presence. It has to continue to provide us with unbiased evidence. We need to support our plans and activity. I pointed to areas where I think they should stand up and, and support the stance that we uh, have taken in terms of upholding and strengthening advancing human rights and equality. We have to ensure the Welsh people's rights are upheld. And I'm hopeful that all members will join me within working together to improve equality across Wales in all its forms. And can I say that this afternoon, I think, where we have had this theme on equality, particularly focusing on anti-racism, has been powerful. And I'm grateful for all members who played their part in making this <coughs> event so important and this debate. Do you Val? A question you are the lead Derbyn a Cynig, I was in Rwylod and Gwrthw Nebi. Nagos, fel i derbynnu'r cynnig yn unol â rheol sefydlog 12.36, mae hynna'n golygu nad oes pleidlais y prynawn yma a dyna ddiwedd ar yn busnes ni. 